You know, when I was a small child, my worst nightmare was going into an American prison. How crazy it must be, and here I am, it's for real, and uh, you just don't know what to expect. There's 60 grand on the table and a gun. So I called them up and said, no, 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 I'm not coming, not coming, not coming. They said, you got to, you got to. So we went. He left the hotel room and the door came in with 10 armed cops. Butted Philip in the head immediately with the gun. Told us to get on the ground and all that. But I got tried and convicted of a first degree felony with a minimum mandatory of 15 years, knowing full well the judge knew that it was fake cocaine. They just fiddled with the controls and the thermostat and just steamed him and to death. And when the inmates moved him, he actually, his you know, skin would come off of his body. Looking at this guy and he was a muscle man and I was just so scared of him until I looked down and he had the bottom half of a 14 year old boy. So all of a sudden it changed and uh, I ended up knocking his teeth out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, because of some confidential informant points his finger at whoever he wants and I end up doing his time on the house like that and lose my voice and lose all everything I had. Uh, so I want a fair trial. Give me a fair trial. That's what, that's all. Oh, I lost all that. I lost my mother, I lost my voice. You know, you would have thought I was Jack the Ripper, wouldn't you? <laughs> Welcome to the world of Malcolm and Phil, who have been in doing hard time in Florida prison. They are Brits, and the things that they have just told us, sat on the sofa before we even started filming, my head is spinning. This is gonna be one of the most mental podcasts you have ever heard. They just told me about a guy who was steamed to death. Um, there was a, a situation where a guard was walked in on, and the guard was, producing breast milk in the prison. There's a confidential informant in the jury. Now with Phil, he speaks very low because he was tortured during this case to silence him. And they did some medical uh, malpractice to his voice box uh, to try and completely make it so he couldn't talk. So he's gonna be holding a microphone close to his mouth um, so that you can hear him properly. But Phil served 13 years in the Florida system. Malcolm served th three years. A shout out to D Dario for organizing this. If you've not seen the D Dario podcast in Thai prison, it's gone viral, check it out. Huge thank you for coming on, fellas. Definitely. Yeah, nice to meet you. And you said it was uh, a mental day was the day before you got arrested. So should we start with that? Yeah, so we're out in Fort Lauderdale, Miami, looking at Harley Davidson's and sports cars. Anyway, Philip had a big bag of cash on him and I said, let's spend it on bikes and, and, and we didn't. And then we're sitting indoors that night smoking some pot and there's a knock on the front door and there's a policeman at the door. And he said, your van window's open and I didn't think nothing of it. There's 60 grand on the table and a gun. And he said, make sure your window's shut and he left. And I sat down to Philip and went, oh, that was weird. That was strange. Anyway, good night. We went to bed. I woke up the next day. We're not going. What do you mean? I've had a night where we're going to get busted at midday today. He went, no, 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 not true. You're nuts. So I said, all right, I'm calling them up. We're not going. So I called them up and said, no, 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 I'm not coming, not coming, not coming. They said, you got to, you got to. So we went to pick up three kilos. Of oh, we're going to call it white. White. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> or, no, three kilos of uh, stuff. Yeah. Because <laughs> I used to say that all the time. Okay. You, can't, you know, it wasn't, there was nothing there. And the other thing's green and the other thing's brown. <laughs> yeah, so we went to pick up the stuff and I knew something weren't right. 
and um, I'm, we get into the hotel. Well, look, I'm looking around. I'm in the bathroom. I'm looking in every nook and cranny behind the curtains, knowing they're around somewhere. <laughs> and then uh, the guy puts the stuff on the table. Phil gave, it, gave him a box of milk tray. <laughs> and um, I get a razor blade. And I said, oh, what's that? I've never seen anything like that before, because I haven't. And uh, he went, hold on, I'll go and get the rest. And uh, he left the hotel room and the door came in with 10 armed cops. Butted Philip in the head immediately with the gun. Told us to get on the ground and all that. And then marched us off down to the local police station. Asked if we wanted a job working for them. Immediately... Uh, they didn't do no field test, nothing. Didn't do nothing. Just took us to the police station, put us in a room together on our own, and we looked at each other and went, Phew. And then they said, you want to work? We said, no, and they took us to the county jail, Fort Lauderdale. What was it like entering county? I got a picture of it on my phone. Well, we'll try and yeah, add, we'll try and add bedlam, that. Bedlam, that's what it is. It's yeah. Bedlam every day. Hold, hold the microphone yeah, up. It's bedlam yeah. every day. What yeah. do you mean by bedlam? Just people coming in from the streets, high on drugs. It's, you know, they're yes. climbing up the walls. They've never been incarcerated before. They're not going to get their fix. And so it's more crazy in the county jail than it is by the time Forgot we get to, to mention, prison. Forgot to mention we was down in uh, Fort Lauderdale Beach that night, weren't we, in a hotel and all that. So it's New Year's Eve. We're in the county jail now. It's New Year's Eve. We're getting marched in. So it's just checking and they're like, you're here for trafficking up to 150 kilos of stuff. And that was it. They book us in. But I went to the third floor. You didn't, did you? Uh, they well, just I, separated us, didn't they, straight away? Yeah. And then I'm on the third floor and they do an AIDS test on you. Did You refused that, didn't you? And they don't kept, know. Well, you ended up staying in the main jail, didn't you? A long time ago. So I'd done an AIDS. And then they uh, shipped me out immediately after three days to a a low level place. Yeah. So it turns out the cocaine's not real. So bottom line is, you know, I personally done thirteen years on the house for what they can call baby laxative, which is a substitute which um, cocaine dealers use it to cut. Uh, cocaine with and it's a third degree felony um, but I got tried and convicted of a first degree felony with a minimum mandatory of 15 years knowing full well the judge knew that it was fake cocaine knowingly we're going to get to the, the case what were the inmates like when you went in in the beginning um, first night in chaos yeah Violence, yeah, aggression. Threatening. Towards you guys? No, towards Edmund, anybody. Me the first yeah. time. Well, because I'm waiting in line to make the phone call, the free phone call, big 400 pounder, pushing everyone out of the way. So I'm I'm like, you can't do that. I know you from outside. I know you're always in 7-Eleven. I'll say hello to you. You know what I mean? You can't be doing that in here, mate. You, you know, we've got to make a phone call. You're not jumping in line. They do. So it's all that. But then they're offering you a sniff. Because it's all in there. Yeah, it's just intimidation like you would get anywhere, you know. If but you've you got something, they want it. Yeah. And uh, they want to get to the shower before you. They want to get to the shower before you. Being so, a you know. a white man is completely different. You're in the hood. You're in the hood. And what were your cellmates like? Different. Crazy. They changed Crazy. How daily, many of them don't they? By yeah, because it's like that. Well, Some my get... first inmate was a little black guy. Yeah. Some get bail, some... But you don't no. know that so I'm stripping off because I've been stripping off since I was a kid at school and you can't strip off in front of them. You can't do none of that. So you're learning it straight away. What did he say to you? They throw things at you. What did he throw at you? Toilet roll. <laughs> so I get him back the next day. <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? Yeah. Things we used to do. Well, you know, you just... It's another world, isn't it? You know, you go into another world that's their world, it's not my world, and 
that's it. What can you do? You just have to. So just just to know. set the scene a bit, then, because I was in Arizona. So in Arizona, it is half Mexican American and Mexicans. It's a quarter white. Mm. And then you've got the blacks are the smallest, but there's, there's actually a few Native Americans as well. Where well, you guys were, what was the racial? Mostly racial? Uh, it was, uh, black, yeah. uh, Spanish, Spanish, and then you had uh, redneck minority of Asians and a very few Native Americans yeah. and very very few. Uh, Europeans, so there was no staff. whites, hardly. Not really, no. Well, no, the whites were the uh, yeah the white Americans, but they were no. say fifty percent, and uh, out of that fifty percent, most of them were just sex offenders. Oh dear, you know, mm. I, I would say. Did they have the Aryan Brotherhood in there? The Nazis. All that, yeah. Yeah, they yeah, had but all it didn't make no difference to me. I was. I, it don't bother me, none of that. It didn't. I know. Well, did they come up to you and say, look, hey, no, well, I wouldn't let Here's them. the rules. You can't talk to me and all that at first. Yeah. But in jail, it's completely different because they put us, they shipped me out immediately. So I didn't see him for a month. I'm in the stockade, an ex military base, until they know my crime. Then they're like, that, no, you've got to go supermax. So he arrives a month later into my area and he's like a dorm down. There's six dorms, three each side. It's an old, with the, the the young kids, young offenders unit. So they're up at three in the morning marching around your unit. Yeah, and there's 60 of you in a room. It stinks. You're, I'm laying on the floor for three days watching. And and they've got Jerry Springer on. <laughs> Loud. <laughs> yeah, because they might get a flash. So they're all around the telly. And they've got the phones under the telly. So I've turned the telly off. Turn the telly off. Brave. You can't do that. I know. Things I did in there. What happened? Nothing. Do they think you were Guards good? go mad, call you over, and they pick on you quickly to show that you've done something that you can't, and they're on you. Anyway, nothing happened to me. Just said you can't. I'm all right. Because I'm laying on the floor for three days. It stinks because you've got your showers, your food, and it's all blocked, and people have got problems, and it's freezing cold as well. So I'm laying on the floor watching and watching and watching and watching everybody. And I see an empty bunk and I run and get it. And they're like, hey, you can't have it. You can't have it. You're not allowed to have that. So I'm in the corner with car wash and a bug. Yeah, I've got a bug below me and car wash here. He'd been shot up the arse, a black guy. I'm sorry? He'd been shot up the arse. Oh, okay. By the cops. Yeah, car yeah, wash. Yeah, a lot of that going where they yeah, shoot they come you. in, they're all ripped a bit because of the dogs. They put the extra teeth in them. Yeah, they put the covers, the titanium covers teeth on the canines on the because they, they uh, use the dogs as so a They all come sport. in torn to bits. Mm. Honestly, it's mad. I worked in the hospital in the end. It, anyway, it's yeah, another say to Yeah, they'll uh, say to a, a guy, where's the knife? Where's the knife? And really... What they're saying is to the dog, get him. By saying, where's the knife? The dog knows. Anybody can hear the police say that. They're just ask him where the knife is, but the dog is being told, get him. And they've got rip metal. Him to pieces. Yeah, they put pro proper teeth in them. Yeah, just because they don't want the canines breaking. So they put the titanium over the top because it's going to do a lot of work. They send the dog in. We're going to send the dog in, whether you come out, whether you come out or not. You're, you're, the dog's coming in, <laughs> and they do. Madness. So your cellmates are bug and car wash. Yeah, <laughs> I have got sixty of them. I have got a Iranian. He was a, he was flying stuff in with his own plane. There's all sorts in there. You meet. I've met the drunken airline pilots. I've met everybody. Doctors who chop patients up on crack. I mm -hmm. met them all. Yeah, the wife goes yeah, away the, for the, the weekend. The American airline pilot, oh so it was at our jail, and we'd be behind them, and you'd see the aeroplanes come in at Miami, and I'd be behind the, the pilots, and we'd say, look at them pilots, they've got to be drunk. Look at the way they're banging. They was on probation when they got arrested for drink driving them pilots, before. Drink flying. Yeah, so we're in the stockade. I'm like, hey, why, why? I see my way, Wreckfield, Sunday church. Well, you know, <laughs> hallelujah, with them all, everyone singing. He went, what? Anyway, he come out. I'm like, come on, we've got to go in the law library. He went, what? I went, yep. 
we got to get out of here. And now I'm because, an authority on the law, but I can't help myself. I've got so far, but I can't go any further. So I'm in the corner now with car wash and these other guys, one guy, a redneck for shooting someone on his land and a, a guy, am I allowed to say that? Mixed race. Yeah, mixed race. Same stuff. Uh, he said, look, I'm an ex-public defender helper. I can let me read your case. Because they say, don't let anyone read your case because they're cops, In which is true. So anyway, I'm looking at it. I'm suspicious about it. Anyway, I'm like, it's all photocopy. Everything's photocopies. So like, he said, oh, no, no, they got no evidence against you. I went, what do you, how do you know? Just looking at that, he said, I can tell. There's no, you'll be out of here soon. Three years at the most. I'm like, I don't believe it. Anyway, a month goes by, feels and we're back and forwards so like pack it up seven o'clock one night, they take us to a supermax in Pompano. Unbelievable, wasn't it, when we went in there? Mm. Brand so, new place. So how long were you in the first place, the stockade? Uh a month. Well, did anything in there crazy happen that you've not yeah, told give us, us about? Your food. What was the food like? Oh, terrible life. Really hungry well, all the time, just a little handful of carrots. And I don't know. If you like know what's going on and... with the food supplier, yeah, but no, you're always hungry, and it's um... so you're only getting throwaway stuff from Publix that's going to the dump. He buys that, spends the other lot of money on himself. That's what Sheriff Joe did, yeah. yeah. Rotten food, green bologna, mouldy yeah. bread. Yeah, green bologna. The raccoons wouldn't eat it. They'd have legs missing coming over the barbed wire, and then they'd just run off without no food because they won't eat the bologna. <laughs> <laughs> it's mental. <laughs> what was your evening meal? Oh, it could be yeah. Yeah, yeah, slot. Then beef patties, wasn't it? And yeah, all that. patties. Emu and meat patties. Beans and rice and just like ravioli and just... And it was the portions, it was like kids' portions. So you was hungry straight away could, after you'd finished. Could you buy anything from the commissary? Never yeah, did. And, and that was a big rip off, you know, oh, very expensive. It. All, all garbage, junk, sugar stuff. Honey buns and just junk. And it was a and if you didn't spend the money, they would take three dollars a day. So you if you didn't you know the system Two or three days can go by before you know to put a stop on it, but there goes nine, twelve dollars of your, you know, the money that you have very little of to begin with. So it's a very, you know, oh, it's a horrible system where it's just take your money. They have the cash machines outside for the families uh, to put money on your Phone account. Phone calls cost a fortune, you know. Everything is a monopoly to make money. What What was the worst violence you saw in the stockade? No, no, no violence. All right, go over to the maximum security. So I'm in then. the stockade, and it's like, give us your food and all that, because they see you on the phone, and you get a little yeah, bit tearful. You get a few people hit with <laughs> and a they lock. watch you, like, give us your food, and you're like, hey, no, you ain't getting me on your food. So you got to stand your ground immediately. Anyway, so we get moved out of there, don't we? Because mm -hmm. of our. Uh, Time and offence is what we're looking at. Go to a supermax. I lose Philip. We get in there. They lost me for 12 hours. They put me in general population. Outrageous madness. Complete madness. You went to GD or somewhere, didn't you? Mm. But you was in a fight immediately, weren't you fighting? With yeah, no, just on top because you're in dormitories as well. And it's um, it just... They cut the crap, you know. What was the, the fight you got in? Oh, I got into all kinds of fights. of fights. What was the first one? First one was you know, someone jealous because I was a, a good hustler. I would fix things, make things, make needles, make this, make that. And, you know, he couldn't make anything. And it was just a jealousy thing. And I'm going to, you know, show teach you a lesson type thing. And I was like, you know, he was a big muscle man and I was really scared. and. It wasn't until I was behind him going to chow once that I looked, I was right behind him and I'm looking at this guy and he was a muscle man and I was just so scared of him until I looked down and he had the bottom half of a 14 year old boy. So all of a sudden <laughs> it changed and uh, I ended up knocking his teeth out. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. He had two false teeth here, and these two teeth held in them two false teeth. When that one come missing, he didn't have no way Gone. of holding any teeth in. <laughs> Uh, so that was one, and another one was uh, it just people trying to rob you and mm. take your stuff, and you have to stand your ground. That's because that's all you can do. You know, I, I broke my knuckle, my knuckles, that would never be the same. See the way it goes over, mm. cross it over on its own. That was hit and miss, and that kind of thing. And he saved me life with that one. What part of the journey was that on? Before we got home invasion in Boston. Before you got arrested? Yeah. What oh, happened? Yeah. We got a uh, like home invasion in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. We had a warehouse full of uh, Jags and Heelys. And, and two guys tried to rob us. Micro light and Airstream trailer in there and two guys tried to rob us. Go on, take us through it. And uh, um, we ended up, um, I ended up, getting the week of the two we're sitting in the airstream situation and then the guy that was about to murder him is bludgeoning him with a tea kettle i hit over there with a propane bottle and that you know shocked him a bit shocked him enough to get out of there quick and then we just end up smashing that car up that was in the driveway and then we never saw him again, did we? No, he rushed me up the hospital, didn't you, in the back yeah. of the pickup truck. Yeah, they pulled all his toes out of the sockets and everything. Cold his head open. Oh, Internal God. bleeding, stitching. <laughs> I was smashed to bits. They thought I'd been in a skiing accident. Yeah, so uh, anyway, we survived that. You went to Supermax. Yeah, so we're in Supermax for 13, you was in 18 months, weren't you? Anyway, I'm in Supermax, they moved me to GP, it was chaos, chaos, I was in there for a month, like, you know, proper chaos, horrible, really intense, just want to get a machine gun. Anyway, I'm like that to him, in, like, get us up for court three o'clock in the morning, it's horrible, you go down in the old incel, you know. Anyway, so... I'm like, you've got to move, get up alongside me, up upstairs, get into GED or something, get into a program. And I'm in, the, I end up going up there, but there was a fight. So they moved me to the religious wing. So everyone thinks I became religious. And I've got my Bible walking around. They had pictures of me all this, didn't you? Think, yeah, someone had a poo in his shower and he said, holy shit. <laughs> That's shush, can't say so that. So we, we managed to ride together and they didn't know. Yeah, I so, was in one side and he was on. So you was, could... the wreck, it was indoor wreck, supermax. You're up on the sixth floor in a cage, but you all eat together. You do shifts. So all the food comes in, you all eat, and you go back to your bunks or you got your day rooms and all that. So but, we could communicate. Yeah, we'd go into the wreck or church on a Sunday and we'd talk, but you've got to be careful. But the guards didn't know we were co-defendants. Yeah. Get the story straight and it still didn't do me any good because they still got me. So I'm yeah. saying to him, they ain't got nothing on us. I've seen the real lab test, proper ones, so I've got a new lawyer public defender saying look you got to tell the judge we want there's no evidence and she's gave them 15 days to come up with the real you know the evidence against us and they couldn't because the la so i've said to the lawyer how much does it cost to test everything he went it's eight grand i said well you can't afford to do that there hasn't been a test we ain't got a test we haven't got a proper chain of custody where's it all gone so the judge like 15 days so i'm like we've done it so we go into court they're like that we ain't, ain't got no evidence the prosecutor his lawyer, his new one, was it Glass, wasn't it? Mm, I call him Jeffrey Ass. <laughs> He's a top, top lawyer. You know, he got Glass and I had my third public defender. So once they knew, this is a year's gone by now, it's chaos. Every month is chaos. And uh, um, he's like... Uh, you're going to uh, have to do a lot of time and all that. I'm like, no, no, no. They offered me 10. I said, we got to let us go. We've done our time. We've done more than a year. And then they cut and said, nine, seven, six, five, four. Then we go to court, didn't we? Called me first. He said, be careful what you're telling. <laughs> anyway, his lawyer come up to me in the courtroom, which he's not allowed to do. 
and my lawyer, they sort of they put me in the right place so they can come and chat with me. They're like, hey, look, 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 we got you a deal. Three years. Tell Philip he's got to take the deal. I said, so we'll give you 24 hours. Go back, come back tomorrow. I'm like, all right, cush D. I'm like, I ain't taking no deals. I'm like, all right, we've got to go back tomorrow. So they've called me first. I took the deal. Why did you take the deal? Because you got threatened with 60 years. Yeah, they said 60 years in court the first day and they put an immigration hold on us. And they don't need evidence. Mm. All it takes is... Well, if it's real stuff, it's 15 years on one, isn't it? Well, there's a minimum mandatory of uh, 15, but it carries 30 years for the actual trafficking charge and 30 years for the conspiracy, conspiracy. charge. But it has to be real. If it's not real, it's a third degree felony, so you get probation. So we were more than the time served on the crime. But the judge was involved in it as well. She knew. She was a pothead. Let him go, Lebo, her name was. Yeah, she, um, she was famous for jumping out of a big cardboard case in a hotel foyer naked when she was in her younger days <laughs> high on cocaine. For a birthday gift. Yeah, you can't yeah. say that, can we? <laughs> they used to call him, uh, call her, let him go, Lebo. She's admitted what she'd done in his case as well, hasn't she? Yeah, she said that if after she committed perjury, that if there was a dog in my courtroom, it was because it was extremely sick and the medication had to be given at certain times. And... Uh, that's why she had to bring the dog to my trial because she had to give it medication at my trial. All right, hold on. So you've took a plea bargain. You've refused a plea bargain. So now you have to go to trial. Yes. How, how long after your arrest did you go to trial? Oh, About time. 18 months, yeah. wasn't it? And what was your preparation for that like? Very little. Uh, my attorney said, no, there's going to be no problem. You can't be charged with trafficking in cocaine because there was no real cocaine. There was no transaction. Okay. No money had changed hands. Trust me, I got this. And everything, you know, you're going to get time served. And it wasn't true. And they put a confidential informant in my jury, Paul, which I had removed. But I said that... Your Honour, maybe there were two in my jury because there was definitely one. Maybe there was two. And um, microphone. I mentioned to the judge about the independent lab test and I said, Your Honour, this, I said it was fake in then. Let's call it, let's call it white. For the yeah, white. Edit. White then. And I'm calling it white now. You're taking me to trial for fake white. She didn't say anything. And I had the independent lab test that was incorrect. And she, all she had to do was say, OK, we need a continuance because it's very important part of the crime. If it's fake, then it's a third degree felony. and You'd be more than time served. So that you're going to ruin my whole life knowingly that it's fake. You know, you, a confidential informant isn't allowed to even touch real. No. White. So they use white. 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 Um, so that's why they use fake. And they get the arrest, they do a plea deal, and no one's and none the wiser. And because I didn't, they, they used every trick in the book to intimidate me. I had a German shepherd in the courtroom. The court bailiff had a dog in the courtroom in a cage. I was in a cage outside the courtroom. And I was sh I'm shackled with padlocks at my trial. I'm laying in prison at three o'clock in the morning, like, pack it up. I'm like, what? They're like, you're going to trial as a witness, so everyone knows. I'm like, I ain't a witness to anything. They're just doing it for money. I'm on the bus going to McDonald's with the screws and the cops. I'm like, get us a Mackie D. They're like, no, we can't do it. I'm like, it's just me on the bus on a Bluebird all the way back to Fort Lauderdale. Twice. I'm like, what am I doing here? You're... So you go on the go back to the check in at Fort Lauderdale, main jail. They're like, you're here for two reasons snitch or giving back time. So which one is it? I'm like, well, it ain't none of them. I'm just here for money transporting. They, would, they don't believe it. The guy who's in charge of the, the dorm or wherever you are It's mad. So what happened next? Nothing. 
they just ship me back to prison. They don't even take me in because they're, they're just doing it. I'm like, what am I sitting down here for? I didn't even know. I read it in the paper about him in the Sun Sentinel. Hope you're enjoying the podcast. Here's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. Many of our viewers have saved thousands using Rocket Money to save the money off subscriptions they didn't even know about. Rocket Money cancels subscriptions for people that are tricky and time consuming. Rocket Money also alerts you to subscriptions that can save you money. Try it free for 30 days, just enough time to try it, and then completely forget about it. In fact, over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about. You could be wasting money and not even realizing it. Rocket Money helps you find those forgotten subscriptions so you can stop paying for ones you don't use. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Stop throwing your money away, cancel unwanted subscriptions, and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, rocketmoney.com slash Sean. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Enjoy the podcast. Yeah, because uh, the, uh, the, the case of when the dog escaped and it chased the chief judge down the hallway... <laughs> The uh, Guess Judge what? Lebo got reprimanded and she said, um, the judge said, I saw a big dog and it chased me. And I testified that I believe that Judge Lebo's dog was in the heat and maybe would explain why her dog was so restless, whining and barking at my trial and eventually did escape and chase the chief judge in the hallway and the jury saw all this but in my trial the I headlines mean, was dog sentence man to 15 years for trafficking wasn't it yeah <laughs> woof well, got, he's got oh, it yeah. I mean how common is it to have a dog people, in the courtroom people the pills presence of dog at trial can you pass that to me because the viewers at this point are thinking this is so like you said you don't even tell people these stories because people don't then believe them the other them. one was called court Come to the dogs. Right, let, let me just read this to the viewers then. This <laughs> convict appeals presence of dog at trial. For, this is April 15th, 2011. You can Google this if you've. These guys, the stories are real. Fort Lauderdale, Florida, April 15th. A Florida appeals court has ordered a hearing for a man who says a judge's German shepherd may have prejudiced the jury at his trial. The court ruled Wednesday that Philip Lee's case should be returned to the lower court. The South Florida Sun Sentinel reported Lee, 52, was convicted of white trafficking in 2005 and sentenced to 15 years. The hearing would be on whether the dog had a prejudicial effect. <laughs> In court papers, Lee and Susan, a circuit judge in Broward County, brought her dog to court. The dog, he said, was noisy, barking, whining, and pawing at the barrier between the judge and the rest of the courtroom. Lee said he was kept shackled during the trial, and jurors may have believed the dog was there to protect the judge from him. <laughs> he said his trial lawyer never objected to the dog's courtroom presence or the shackling. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. There we go, more. There's loads of it. Mm. Um, leg court gone to the dogs, April 2011. Leg shackles and an unruly dog in the courtroom may have prejudiced the jury. And the leg restraint was supposed to be concealed, but that proved impossible because of its bulk. This marked Lee as a dangerous character affecting his presumption of innocence, the appellate panel ruled. In a unanimous, unsigned opinion, the panel noted the jury was aware of the dog. Lebo had to correct her dog, which was whining and barking. And on more than one occasion, the dog put its front paws on the swing door that separated it from the courtroom where the judge was presiding, the opinion states. This suggested to the jury that the dog was present for the safety of the court, unnecessarily marking the defendant as a dangerous character. Wow. Just that one small one there. Because the dog has gone to doggy heaven now, so I can't have it as... Um, Defendant, judge's dog nudged jury to convict me. <laughs> I can't even read this yet without laughing. Right, where were you? Yeah, during. During trial, the judge, German Shepherd, wine barked and put his paws up on the swinging door between her and the rest of the courtroom. 
The defendant said in his appeal for the new trial, Philip Lee, 52, argued that because his legs were shackled, the jury may have thought the dog was there to protect Broward Circuit Judge Lobo. Lee, now serving 15-year sentence in Lake City Prison for white trafficking, said his dog on eternity should have objected to the shackles and the shepherd during the July trial. <laughs> did you object to it during the trial? Yes. You did? Yeah. I said I was afraid of dogs because the same breed attacked me while I was a small child. And that's why I didn't testify in my own defence. <laughs> and the court bailiff had his dog in the courtroom in a cage. But the judge did not return a call on Wednesday seeking comment, so no comment from her. Whatever happens next, the dog won't be around to testify or appear as evidence. That's a shame. Since the trial, it has passed on to doggy heaven. Woof. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a rough life. So what else happened at your trial? Uh, they put a confidential informant in my jury pool and I believe that there was two and one actually got into my jury and made him jury foreman or her and your fate is sealed. So Phil, when that sentence came down, how did you feel? Terrible. Yeah, because I didn't see it was coming and the ju my attorney was like, you know, there was no transaction, there was no You trust thought he was going to get out? Yeah. And it was all a lie. But you took the plea going because you kind of saw the writing on the wall. Yeah. But I thought he was going to get out. Because the white wasn't real. Mm. Yeah. There was no transaction. Well, there you can't wasn't actually go to trial where there's no evidence. But have you learned now that they don't need evidence? No, that's what they said to me. This yeah, is the thing with the Andrew Tate, the saying now, that he's, not, he's innocent, he's going to get off. They don't need evidence. <laughs> that's what they said to me the day before they took me to court. Who said that? I'm a third public defender. So we they don't, don't need evidence? Don't need any. Yeah. But you were confident. But if you, you had a fifty thousand dollar lawyer, we he will get you off of it. If it was on your lap, if you had it on your person, he would get you off. Because some of that back, some of that fifty thousand would be handed as back sheesh to yeah. the judge. Yeah. Well, they took sixty in cash, and the, oh, that's another story. Go on. They robbed him. How? Yeah, well, they took sixty thousand um, dollars cash. The plantation police, and because they deemed it as drug money, but then they offered me fifteen hundred dollars to settle the issue and keep the remainder of sixty two thousand. They asked me to sign it away, and I refused. I told them to. So if it's yeah. drug money, you're not allowed to negotiate even a penny. But <laughs> if it's illegally seized. You can do that, and that, but now you've signed it off. So I never did, and I've still got the letter offering me fifteen hundred. Because what happens is, when the police department take your money legally, they have to hand it over to the state, and it goes into evidence with the the uh, any evidence that's seized. There wasn't any evidence. Then the state get to keep that money as um, forfeiture and then they give the police department a small percentage but if the police department don't follow the rules they keep it and keep their fingers crossed that you don't come for it legally he's coming for it and so legally uh, they have to return it because why would you even offer me 1500 to sell in the first place why don't you have all of it if it's the law because it's not the law and they thought well you need fifteen hundred dollars for some canteen money and you're gonna you know want that and you've signed it off and now it's definitely our money so straight away you know why would you it's supposed to go to evidence you know if it's drug money it's evidence but if it goes for evidence it goes over to the state's jurisdiction State gets to keep that money. So, Phil, you've been sentenced. Right. Your heart broken. Were your family there? Were they watching all this? No, but I had my um, sister, wasn't it? No, I, had, you know, my uh, my ex-wife in Massachusetts, and you know, broke her heart. My children's heart. I never got to be a father to my son. He was only three years old. Oh, and, uh, 
Then I got deported. I wasn't in America illegally. I was a legal resident. I'd never been in trouble before, ever. So, it was first offence. First offence. I've never, never uh, sold drugs ever. I've been a classic car dealer all my life and I've been a hard worker. So one time, you know, you, you make a mistake and they throw the book at you like that for something that carries no more than probation and it's against the law to entrap you anyway. This man, Crime creation. Mm -hmm. he was a confident, he was the criminal, he was the drug trafficker. He gets off with five years on an angle monitor. Yeah, they caught him with a kilo red-handed. Yeah. And they has to set up five people to get his deal. Yeah. And that could be anybody, could be yeah. anybody. And it's against the law it's to do that. Thing. Yeah, well, they didn't think, they thought we'd join the gang and they thought we'd go along with yeah, them we and work for them. Yeah, we would just continue. They didn't know that we wouldn't. So how did you find out that Phil had been sentenced? Where were you? Um, when I met him at prison. Yeah, I, I I read it in a newspaper, but then I didn't know where he was. And then I went, I got sent back to, um, what's it called? South Florida. South, South Florida Reception Centre. And I'm walking, walking around the rec field and then I see Philip coming out of the canteen. What was that like? Yeah. Well, we weren't allowed to talk. But I'm like, where are you when I'm over there and I need this, I need that, I'll get you some food, I'll get you some clothes. And then I found him on the rec field the next day. So he, I said, you got to go to the law library. And I got him in the law library, which you can't, but he was a blue and white. And I got him in there because I knew people. And there's nothing we can do. So he was in there for 90 days with me, weren't you, that one? So I had a, I could go anywhere I wanted. I had by then I had my own office. Because yeah, he was a Snow White, and Snow Whites can go wherever they want. We were Smurfs in blue. <laughs> so what happened that day with the guard who was breastfeeding? That was Phil. That was my 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 bunk. He was a nice kid and um, non-violent. He was in there for a sex charge. It was something to do with child pornography, but. Yeah, still a nice kid and um, he had a privileged job and the gangs were on him straight away because of his charge and now they could, you uh, know, um, say what they want, give me some honey buns and this and that. So that was the start of it and he ended up walking into a closet. There was a cleaning closet and there's a female guard in there um, pumping breast milk. And she was shocked, he was shocked, and the ramifications for him were, were huge because, you know, you've, you've walked in on a, uh, on a nursing mother, you know, it's crazy. She was in there on her own? On her own. Just pumping breast milk. Yeah. At yeah. work. In a cupboard. Yeah. The but cupboard. then they have the maternity smokes for pregnant females, and you've only just got to look at one of them wrong and you would never survive. So what, he got steamed, was no. it? No, he committed suicide the next day. How? Uh, he hung himself because he was, a, he, because of his job, he had areas where he could be undetected for a while. You know, a lot of these jobs you can't, you know, really commit suicide, but yeah, he did. It was so sad and, uh, yeah, the other guy, he was in a psychiatric patient and he was troublesome and they uh, they fiddled with the thermostat of his shower and I was in solitary confinement myself and I heard the screams but I kind of was used to screaming and banging and, you know, just uh, mental health issues and so I didn't think anything of it but it turns out that they just fiddled with the controls and the thermostat and just steamed him and to death and when the inmates moved him he actually his you know skin would come off of his body and it was just absolutely horrendous and um it was true i actually heard it but you know they would hurt inmates all the time the, the guards you know, not very nice at all it just no, it's not so bad, you know, as it was because of the cameras and things like that. But it still goes on, and uh, you know, it's the client, it's the clientele. A lot of these men, these prison guards, uh, 
that you know that have come from the swamps in in the Florida Everglades and that you know rednecks and they're just they're, drunk at work. Yeah, they bringing just, in alcohol, selling it. Yeah, they're just more corrupt than the yeah the inmates. The inmates. Oh, it was all corrupt where I was. Yeah, sleeping terrible. with the staff but uh, yeah what a system in uh, like I say I had a perfectly good voice and, and my voice was a little bit hoarse when I got to my first day in prison and I thought it was because I'd come from an air conditioned environment which was the county jail to a non freezing cold that new supermax freezing uh, so they decided to do a biopsy on my vocal cords and removed two bits of my vocal cord and then they put them in the spasm they prescribed me valium to be taken straight away first uh, inmate ever in prison to be to, uh, prescribed to, um, to get this valium to make them relax they didn't give it to me for two months by that time they were already locked in place and now the only reason I can talk just a little bit is because I'm on Botox injections here in this country. Had I been on Botox in prison, my life would have been a lot better because at least I had a voice in prison. I was practically a mute. So because that happened at the beginning of your sentence, how long did you go without speaking? Well, from 2005 to 2017. Let's just clarify this for the viewers then, because my understanding from speaking to Malcolm is that you were fighting the system. The system arranged for bits of your vocal cords. Well, no, that's not exactly how it happened. But um, basically what did happen was that they, they do unnecessary procedures on prisoners. They have their own wing in Jacksonville Memorial Hospital and they bring in prisoners and then they and proceed to do all kinds of, you know, expensive procedures, whether it could be... Um, Insurance, isn't it? And but, but, but the outcome is you were silenced. Yeah, I, I couldn't talk for all them, t all them years. And I can only talk now because I have to have Botox, which collapses my vocal cords and it paralyzes my, my uh, vocal cords. So how did you communicate? communicate with other inmates just by gestures mostly and it's just straining like a really strange strangled voice and sometimes it would be real bad and sometimes i would be completely mute i couldn't talk at all and i had a, a no talking pass so i didn't even have to talk to a guard i could just show a pass no talking because it's a stress to talk and uh, if you look at my medical records, the, it says there was nothing wrong with my vocal cords. But if you look at after my uh, biopsy, the lab said polyps. Oh, okay, polyps. That's why I need time to heal up. I've had polyps removed, but there was no polyps because they said there was nothing no polyps to begin with so why would you do a biopsy to begin with mm. all right so you settled in now he's been sentenced what what happens um well you go through uh, is an iq test and all that you go to school and then they decide to keep you here or send you up the road so they kept me gave me a job take me down the block introduced me to the inmates put me in a room immediately it's a no-no i'm not allowed to share a room with this guy because he works for the governor of the prison he's haitian and he don't want me in there he's sleeping with the sergeant woman i didn't know that so she scuttles back within 10 minutes and says you've got to get out of here so i'm like all right then put me in with this guy jamaican you, you don't share with you don't mix no one wants to stay with him for a reason, but I've been riding with him in the county jail. I knew him. He was a rich Jamaican green smuggler. So he was listening and watching me and Philip all the time, and I didn't know. So when I'm in prison, I see him. He's in a room on his own, and no one wanted to be with him. He's made up a city. He smelt too much, but it wasn't true. But he was a wealthy Jamaican green smuggler. So I check in with him. 
Now he's on the diet line in the canteen. So I know Jamaican slang growing up with Jamaicans when I was younger. So I know what they're talking about. So I got my foot in the door and all that with him. So he said, look, I need me light on of the night. I said, I don't care. You do what you like. He stays up all night. So we were, I, I rode with him for the most of the time in prison, two years. And he was in the diet canteen, cook on the line. So I go with my diet pass. He loads me tray up with chicken wings and all that. And I cover them up and hide them. And I was a chicken smuggler for the Jamaican, smuggling chicken back to, <laughs> to the wing. So then they used to trade me fruit and coffee. And I used to do all their sewing and all that. But they had makeup bags. The girls were bringing them in dental floss, nail polish and all sorts clear because the Jamaicans wanted to look the best. So I knew all about that. I'm like, where are you getting the sunglasses from? Look what they took. Like, How come you got sunglasses? I'm like, oh, you're getting them out of all our property we've had taken off of us. Because now I'm working in um, laundry, which everyone wants to be in laundry because it's money. New sheets, new T-shirts, everything. So I was a look, top laundry man making a fortune. Trading food and sheets, and all the, all the law library guys want the best sheets and the best pillows, and everyone kick, kicks up the stink if you're in a dorm or whatever. They've all got the best stuff. Where's my stuff? You know what I mean? So you get picked on, you lose your do job immediately because you're looking after people when you shouldn't be. Everyone kicks off. But then I got promoted to um, recordly in charge of basketball, baseball, and all that. I had my own office with my music. And me iced coffee. So I'll become everyone's friend then. <laughs> of course. Yeah, so it was all right. Um, no, I never see any violence. None. I got threatened every day. But What would they say? Just about anything. Waiting in line. I want a new pair of trousers. I want this. I used to have to put the toilet roll on, in the toilets outside in the wreck. It's open planned. And the toilet rolls are all be missing. I used to give you a scrabble. And the book, and that'd be missing. They swap the book over. I'm like, you got to give me the book back. Are you the police? No, I'm not the police. Full I'm of criminals. Do, yeah, I'm going to be doing time because you've stole the Scrabble book. So I want it back. I used to hunt them down. They didn't like it. <laughs> but I never got threatened. Well, I did get threatened, but not beaten up. Never. And were you able to keep communication open with Phil? Yeah, right up until the day he got shipped up north, didn't you? Yes, um, pretty much for the 13 years, no. No, we didn't see each other. Yeah. How far into the sentence was it when he got shipped? Uh, I was into just a few months, wasn't it? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd been in a couple of months, when I? So you're getting near the end of yours at that point? N yeah. Yeah, I only had about 13 months left, I think. He Mine came in. was off. just beginning. Yeah, he came in with... I had been in 18 months within the jail and the prison. I got 22 months to do, didn't I, or something like that. And then I spent three months with him. And then one day I'm at the gate early in the morning and he's handcuffed and shackled getting on the Bluebird. He's like, where am I going? And so I went on the Alabama border. And that was the last I see to of To the Panhandle. Panhandle. Okaloosa. What was that like, Phil? Uh, just terrifying really at first you know because you don't um, you know when I was a small child my worst nightmare was going into an American prison how crazy it must be and here I am it's for real and uh, you just don't know what to expect so yeah it was kind of frightening and that was it it's something you had to deal with and I did I dealt with it. Didn't they offer to let you go, though, halfway through your sentence? No, I said there was no deals ever for me. Mm. I couldn't go to work release. I couldn't do anything. No, we couldn't do none of that. Had an immigration hold. Yeah, they put a hold on us the next day, dragged us back into court. Yeah. As soon as we got arrested the next couldn't morning. Do, couldn't do anything. And I wouldn't even know how to fly. Phil, how did you settle into that new prison? Were the prisoners, did they sweat you in the beginning? Uh yeah, they kind of looked for your weaknesses and I didn't show any weaknesses and so they moved on quick. Yeah, they moved on. And they once don't. they know that, you know, you could be just as bad as they are, that's not what they want. They kind of want you to be submissive and um, 
passive towards them and when you're not they find someone else that is how did they know you were not did you demonstrate just because of my body language because of just you know the way i am naturally anyway you know with anyone that comes with any kind of aggression even though i couldn't talk you know that's just your your mannerisms is you know you're not going to be putting up with it. you're not going to take anything from me and I made it clear that I'm a locksmith and I'm not coming after your honey buns. <laughs> you, he was a locksmith in my prison. If you rob me, I'm coming after your photo albums and you don't want we that. did, didn't you? Yeah, because they're going to get wet. It'd fill up uh, someone. Yeah, I put someone's law work in a mop bucket once because he robbed me and I just robbed him back. What, did, I, he, what did he rob you of? Just clothing. Where you were know, you? He went into your cell? Sleep. No asleep, and you know you you have a drawer under your excuse me under your bunk, and at that particular time I didn't lock it, even though I had the best lock in the whole prison that nobody could break into. And so once all the inmates squealed on him, that was it. I just um, picked his lock very easily, just a small little combination lock, and took his law work out and everything else and and he got wet it's very clever so a lot of people didn't mess with me because they knew that don't mess with him because you know you don't want your photo album getting wet anything else but your photo album and so, then you know <coughs> i would um help help the inmates hide all that contraband so I got on that way. They wanted sneakers fixed. They wanted things fixed all the time. They had the money, and I would fix it. Yeah, once they know you can do sewing and all that, they're on you. Yeah, make watch straps, make everything, mm. you name it, V-neck T-shirts and, you know, make shorts and sneakers and change soles on sneakers and make string and make glue and everything you can think of. So... Uh, where I was, when you come to the end of the sentence, everyone's panicking because they send you to a lifer's prison when you've got 14 days left. So they, one night at six o'clock, I'm in the county, like, pack it up. I'm like, what? At night, you don't move us up at night. It's too dangerous. You're going on the bluebird. Get your shit together. I'm going to the Everglades, lifer's prison. So you go in there and they're like, how much time you got? Well, I ain't got any. I'm going home. You, and then they're on you. So there's hiding shit in your bunk and then you're getting searched, you know it's coming. And then like your, your last day, they give you the tightest pants you can wear so you've got to hide your stuff and all that walking across the prison. And they want all your shoes and everything before you leave. So then they march you across the road to um, immigra um, immigration because it's right next door and the shooting range in between. You're doing life and all you hear all day long is pop, pop, pop. Pop, 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 pop. <laughs> Crazy, and you think one of them's going to go stray when you're walking around the wreck field. Yeah, that was Glades, wasn't it? CI. <laughs> yeah. But uh, when I did get to immigration, I got fat for the first time in my life. It was gourmet <laughs> food, yeah. ribs, it was great. And moves Immigration's and crazy, though. Federal. Yeah. It's well, it's, it was. Uh, it's, it is a state. Um, facility but it's their showcase facility because all their other uh, facilities are terrible you know well, my prison was terrible just like run down county jails so were you housed with other people who were going to get deported yeah what were their stories um, just also even Americans being deported were? Yeah, they, they never, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they never became citizens. But Look, they so were. if your parents were in the military, you was in Germany, and you were born in Germany, to, yeah, and you yeah. you go to Lowe's Cinema or uh, B and Q's on a Sunday, and the ice are in there, and they shut the door like paperwork. Well, yeah, they were deporting Americans. people that you would say is one hundred percent American, Americans. but just didn't get the citizenship. Mum didn't do Mum, it. Where's the paper? Mum's dead. You're yeah. going back to Germany. Oh, wow. Yeah, there are lots of people ties like in there that. for years and years in immigration. Don't want to go. Jamaicans don't want to go. 
Yeah, terrible what they were doing. But they the kick immigrants. up in immigration because you're not in prison. I had a bit of green in immigration. I was as high as a kite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but were the, you doing yeah. writs for people? Huh? Did you do writs for people What's like, that? to help them get uh, expedite the deportation? No, I done or fast to, track. But you was you I know, I done all kinds of law work. Yeah. You know, f I had people help me, but then I also helped people that had the same kind of issues as me, so uh, they could use what I was using, and you know, put them in the right direction. And uh, I made case law in two thousand and eleven about the dog and the leg restraints. And but it can go no further, so that's where I am right now. I'm kind of stuck with the next part of my journey, which is I want a fair trial, and but you cannot give me one, so you have to vacate my criminal conviction. That's all that's on the table, and once you do that, then I don't have a criminal conviction, which I shouldn't have anyway. Get your citizenship back. Yeah, I can get my residency Residence. back. Uh, my children are Americans. My son's going to Cambridge University next year, so he's done well, for, you know, for growing up without a father in America. And uh, I want to be able to go back to America. And why, why can't I? Because of some confidential informant points his finger at whoever he wants and I end up doing his time on the house like that and lose my voice and lose all everything I had. Uh, so I want a fair trial. Give me a fair trial. That's what, that's all. What was your, what was your day of deportation like, Malcolm? When they deported me the day, that yeah, day, yeah. just get you up early in the morning, three o'clock. Uh, I, I had an arrest warrant for me, though, in Massachusetts, uh, attaching plates, but I knew they weren't going to come and get me. So they come and get you. I didn't, I went left in prison uniform, grey jumpsuit, uh, took me to Miami airport. And he's just stay in a lounge, a security lounge with food and coffee. You wait there all day long. And I'm looking on the desk, seeing my name. And oh, what's that saying? And then they uh, put you in a mini bus with the other guys. Um, take you to the airport. But they don't take you. You go on the tarmac. And then you pull up at the separate door, set of ladders up the side and everyone's getting on the plane they will make you wait till last and they give you passport to the chief stewardess and then you go march up the back of the plane with the marshal you cuffed no no i just had a big brown envelope so i drunk coffee all the way home got to london threw all my stuff in the bin and walked straight through nothing my son was waiting for me outside how did it feel on the plane Great, but I thought they might turn back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a relief, isn't it? Yeah, it's different for me because I've come out of like a time warp, you know, for all the years. Yeah, completely years, different. So when he got released? Don't recognise any cars that are on the road and fashions and cell phones and... It was an alien world to me. I was going to say, it must have been quite difficult because you wouldn't have been able to speak to your family on the phone for years I hadn't either. used a telephone in over 10 years. I and couldn't send a text, remember, when I you I couldn't even that. testify <laughs> on my own behalf. I was completely mute. I went to say a word and I couldn't even whisper. A whisper couldn't whisper. That's how cut off I was and it's only because I'm having Botox now that I can Phil how did it feel that knowing that Malcolm was home when when you and you're on your own and how did that feel it's yeah it's not a good feeling at all but your your mind's racing so much with every other issue you know and you're being bombarded all at the same time you just filter things out that just you cannot take it all in and you can't concentrate on maybe you know your freedom and am i really gonna do this 15 years no definitely not next year i'll be okay and then 
one year goes to the next and before you know it goes you, past you've quick, done that time it? right well let's break that down then what year did you get released Malcolm? 2007 january all right let's go over the years slowly then phil so what was your life like in 2007 2008 that well, it was uh, just terrible. boys just you know you're treading war on this vicious, illegal uphill battle trying to get an attorney. Um, you know you're still reveling over the fact that you, you know, your first attorney took pretty much your life savings, and then where do you go with very little funds? I've done more work than these lawyers, didn't I? Yeah, so it's a constant battle to for survival. And, you know, I did make case law, so I did, it did pay off to a certain point because, you know, it's, it's um, proven I didn't get a fair trial. So, so after Phil left then, how many prisons did you go through after Phil left? Me, no, Malcolm. Malcolm. Sorry, after Malcolm left. Oh, seven. 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 All right, so what was the first one? First one was Okaloosa CI in the Panhandle. That's the one where we're at now. Yeah. What was the next one like, and why did they move you? Because of my condition after having this um, biopsy on my vocal cords, they moved me closer to the hospital, rather because you couldn't go on a day trip from Okaloosa to um, Central Florida. So they then moved me to a facility near the hospital. So then I could go for day trips to the hospital. Can you describe a day trip for us, what it involves? A day trip would be wake up first thing in the morning and have you get a, uh, maybe a bran bag for your breakfast. Pack lunch. And you would get on the Bluebird and you would go to certain uh, medical facilities, whether it be Jacksonville Memorial Hospital, it could be... Um, to Lake Butler, RMC Lake Butler, where all the um, specialists come and um, basically recruit all these inmates for procedures. And then you will go to their hospital. My doctor's name was Dr. Aguilar. I called him Dr. Dracula. <laughs> and he performed all these heinous procedures on inmates that you would never believe. It was something like out of uh, Frankenstein movie and um, he took two pieces of perfectly good flesh for my vocal cords and I used to be a pretty good singer when I was younger and just chopped them off and then I lost my voice for all them years and then they blamed it on a disorder called spasmonic dysphonia which has the same symptoms. Did you know right away you'd lost your voice? Uh, well, when I saw the oper the post operative report saying I had polyps, then I thought that's why I've lost my voice because I've had polyps removed and I just need time to recover. Yeah, that's understandable. And then I looked at the pre operative report that says there were no lesions, no growths, and my vocal cords looked essentially normal. So then why would you then decide to cut? So when they cut them, they put them into spasm, medication that wasn't given in time, and then they locked in place. And then they changed all of that around to, oh, it's not this, it's dysphonia. Same symptoms, and that's it. But my medical record right here shows there was nothing wrong with my vocal cords. That was a little bit swollen. Maybe that's why my voice was hoarse. Well, it was maybe. that recycled air, wasn't it? We was in yeah, Pompano. If I go into any AC now, I I become mute. mute. So it's, well, you know, like you said you were studying the law. Did you try and sue the prison for this? Yes, and I what was happened? just going man in circles because I'm an inmate, and who am I? And I had all kinds of rulings and I kept it alive and the statute of limitations kicked in and uh, you're fighting, you know, David and Goliath. Is, um, if I was a, a private citizen, they would have to settle for millions with me, wouldn't they? Because it's, uh, 
I have the proof that you committed an unnecessary procedure on me just because I'm a prisoner and you have your own prison ward in the hospital with bars on the windows in the hospital with I guards. I worked in a prison hospital. So if a lawyer is watching this in America who would help you without having to pay him up front, is, is there still recourse or is the statute of There's limitations? There's definitely recourse. There's newly discovered evidence. There's all kinds of ways back in. Because I've made case law where I didn't get a fair trial, that means there should be some recourse. Give me a new trial. Do something. You can't just say, well, you didn't get a new trial, but well, good luck with that. There's got to be something that you can give me. Well, give me a new trial. I will willingly go for a new trial tomorrow. You've got no evidence. You've got no witnesses. You've got nothing. You couldn't possibly go to trial anyway. Uh, uh, cool Judge Lee Bowes committed perjury on the witness stand. She can't testify. The, the, the uh, attorney can't testify because it's a matter of record that he knew it was fake. You just Stop. make a whole mockery of the whole system. But, or vacate my criminal conviction. I didn't get a fair trial, then scrap everything. Let me start again. That opens the door for attorney malpractice. So if any lawyers are watching this who want to help Phil, contact us through our socials and we'll, we'll connect you guys and, and we'll take it from there. Yeah, mm. just need so, a, a real a, a attorney on, on my side, really. But your really. paper works in the appellate court, isn't it? Yeah, my, you know, the, the last thing I have in the court is a mandate for further proceedings. Well, I can't seem to get further proceedings. If I could, what would these further proceedings be? There is nowhere to go for them apart from, okay, what do you want? Okay, I want to get rid of this conviction that was illegal to be in with so I can go back to America and you know, be with my children over there and so not, not have a criminal conviction. I don't have one in the UK. So we're going through the seven prisons then. You said this second prison was put you near the medical facility. Uh, near the medical facility, and it was a psychiatric camp called Hamilton CI. So there was a psych patients there, which made it... In some ways easier, but in some ways more dangerous. Because, in what ways? Yeah. Could you describe well, any because, stories? Because, you know, if they're psychiatric patients, they're heavily medicated, so, uh, you know, they are less likely to cause a problem if they're drugged up. And then on the flip side, you know, you're dealing with uh, the criminally insane who you just don't know if that one pill is going to put them over the wrong edge. Did you see that happen? All the time, you know, is, they could would... Could describe a story where it happened? Well, there'd be inmates that would be, um, you know, just they would just flip out and just strip off naked and just run around and the guards are trying to catch them. Same in my place. They would fight each other with uh, locks and putting, you know, locks in socks and eating Lot of each gun other. In. Yeah, there'd be all kinds of masturbation going on. and All the time gunning, all the time. Gunning? He, yeah, in the canteen, waiting in line, they'd be gunning. What's they, gunning? Well, they cut holes in their pockets and... Wank. Yeah. yeah. They, they cut man. holes in the pockets and they... Yeah, if there's a, a staff... Uh, Tommy like, Tank. Yeah, and then... Yeah, they're non-stop he, masturbating, they call it gunning. Gunning, and They yeah. will do it. They have to do it all the time. And they have to do it all the time. Yeah, they do it waiting in line behind us, but... It, in the library. Yeah, so it's good, because you'll be standing and all of a sudden, bang, they get knocked over. The women, proper women who, like, proper... They just clothesline them, take them out. Because he's gunning on, he's watching her and gunning. And then you've got another one watching, he's like, and then they come and get him. It's non stop. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, no, just terrible. Crazy. You've got uh, communal showers where there's no oh. privacy, and uh, the inmates will come in there, they'll have a, a nudie picture in a plastic bag, and he'll stick his up in in front of him and these mate will do the next and his other mate there'll be three young men it's called going on a in date. the shower 
Yeah, it's called it's called going it's called going on a date when you take a picture of you. Well, you're just having a day your daily shower. We weren't allowed to have anything like that in our place. Not nothing on your walls. Nothing. No, you wasn't. Didn't go on any dates in there. No. No. Did anyone try to date you? You couldn't have a picture in your locker. No, but they used to do strange things. They'd get they'd uh, bring a what they called your blue and white. Smurf. A Smurf. They bring us a, a life of Smurf into our compound, 60 years of age, proper handful, rapist, lifer, put them in our unit, and he'll walk around and say, you're next, blue eyes. <laughs> put the fear of God up, people. But the, the guards would do that to create problems. And he shouldn't even be in our section, but they would. What's he doing here? Would Why nobody would... try and hit him? Well, no, they're too, they're too big, aren't they? They're These terrible. Are like the booty bandit. Yeah, the booty bandit says send them in. To what Joey Torres told us yeah. about the booty bandit. Weird. Of Corker in prison. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. Here's a word from our sponsor, Manscaped. Cannonballs. This summer, it's not about the size of those cannonballs. Thank God, as I can barely see them. <laughs> well, they were big enough to do the job, weren't they, Jen? <laughs> we kicked. It's about making a splash with our friends at Manscaped. Prep for barbecue season by making sure your grill master has the hottest dog seen this summer. When you're at the cookout, let the meat speak for itself with Manscaped's Performance Package 4.0. It's time to get ready and not sweaty. The Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 has everything you need to guarantee you'll have the most mouth-watering treat at the party. They have built the ultimate bundle for your summer grooming. So, get 20% off and free shipping with the code SEAN20, S-H-A-U-N-20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code SEAN20. Manscaped, the perfect way to get your patties sizzling hot this summer. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Back to the podcast. Yeah, and there's all kinds of, uh, you know, lady boys in there. Yeah, nothing ever happened to me, nothing like that. No one, we just get threatened every day, but... Yeah, I got prop- propositioned he, all the time. Yeah, he did. First couple of days in. Every- yeah. Propositioned by the booty bandits. Yeah, yeah the lady sex. boys. Sex. You try it once, you might enjoy it. Uh, I mean, some of Sean's stories. I'd, I'd agree, and I'd say, okay, I'm willing to have sex with you. And um, they would say, no, no, I, I want to have sex with you. And I'd say, well, I said it first. <laughs> oh, so now top you versus got, bottom. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you mentioned it, and I said it first. Okay, let's go. Oh. But no. The it, thing is, there's, a lot, of gay, there's a lot of gay play, isn't there? And you've got to banter along with it. Yeah, I never had a problem with the gay boys in there. No one, but you'd you'd see young kids crying their eyes out where they've waxed them all up. But yeah, they, they get, get a eye on the older spice, and they wax them up. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, you're allowed to buy a um, wax hair wax, and they sell it for that reason. And so they wax back sack and crap. Yeah, they wax you up like three of them will get you, and they just chuck a back, back, pop of wax in there quickly you know the black and white stuff it's called black and white isn't it edge wax and in they go I've seen them <laughs> guys crying and all that men in diapers crying who've been in diapers yeah in the hospital wings where I've worked out of them the back yeah side. where I've been working in the hospital wings they're crying they're like oh, well, miss I want to go to the toilet no you can't you can't and they poo themselves they've got diapers on it's horrible the, the, the staff were like you know you know, you got to sit on your bunk terrible horrible oh. who, yeah, who've been horrible at, people the guards in the hospital wings they would run down the corridor with a, a guy who's unconscious on the gurney and just ram him straight into a wall. I've seen them getting pelt. knocked out their wheelchairs by guards. It's madness. Yeah. What other stuff would you see the guards get up to? Selling their bodies, bringing in ink, alcohol, green. Letting the inmates grope them. Huh? Do have to yeah, it was two hundred dollars for boom boom. Two hundred dollars. Yeah, for boom boom. Yeah, groping a bum. No, sex, oh, sex. with a staff member. So you the put it inmate into, could, could pay 200 Yeah, you put it into their account. 
family. A few and far between, though. It wasn't, you know, rampant, but, it, you know, it did happen. And, you know, if you had money, you could get anything you wanted, I suppose. So. And that, was that female guards or male guards? Both, female, both. yeah. Well, the male guards, most of the guards in my place wanted tattooing. They bring the ink in and the tattoo artists the tat- ink them up. And then the female guards sound like they had it pretty hard. Well, they were too busy um, seeing Dangs over pregnant. I'd be like that, miss, are you pregnant? How do you know him, mate? Well, I'm a man, I mean, miss, I can well, tell. Because you've got a maternity smock on, <laughs> that's why. And were they pre- pregnant through prisoners? Who knows? No. no well. I doubt it, but, you know, a pregnant female in a, in a all-male I mean, psychiatric be in prison. There, but you imagine that's the last place you want to be and they have a uniform specially for you so you don't have to have any time off work. Excuse me, sir, sir, can I get a cigarette? I'm asking a guard. It was a woman. What was the consequences of that? Nothing. And I'd be like that. She'd be like, inmate, get salt on the table, get salt on the table. I'll stick a rocket up my arse, shall I? <laughs> and it all goes quiet in the canteen. <laughs> but I... <laughs> so, some of Sean's stories are the biggest characters he's met. Who was the biggest character you guys met in there? I met the uh, famous cat burglar of Fort Lauderdale, the drunken airline pilots, the doctor on crack who chopped the, the dealer up. I met him. Um, I met Desmond Decker's brother. Jamaica, remember Desmond Decker and the uh, Israelites. Israelites. Desmond Decker, oh, the Israelites. Anyone, anyone who came in who was quite famous, they ship them out the next day. Like cops and all that had been caught doing stuff, and the drunken airline pilots they moved them quick in the What end. was their story? They kept getting drunk while I was flying aeroplanes. Yeah, they got arrested at the. Um, the lounge at Miami International Airport and they know they've been drinking. But they was they, on probation already. Yeah, so the they breathalyzed them. Drink and they flying. Drunk. Fancy that, getting on the plane with them. Yeah, drunk. And, and what was the other two people you said that were? The, uh, the the doctor whose wife went away for the weekend and he thought he'd try some crack and he got all paranoid. He'd been smoking for a few days and the dealer knocked on the door and said, you owe me money. And he said, I've paid you. He said, come in and I'll pay you. And he shot him. And then chopped him up into bits and dumped him up the dump, and that's how they got caught. How he got caught. Well, my friend's name was Headless Harry, and he came from upstate New York with just the head of a woman, and he got um, tried and convicted of murder. And his defence was, well, it's just a head. How can you determine that it was a murder? Because you know, uh. the charge should have been transport in a corpse or body parts. That's not. A, that's not a charge of murder, is it? Because she could have died of anything. And uh, yeah, he uh, put her in a swamp in the swamp alley and uh, he ended up getting 35, 45 years for this head and the body was uh, stayed in upstate New York. And you met him? Yeah, he was a good friend of mine. He was a good salary, friend? Yeah, and he's still doing time and for a head. What, <laughs> just a head. What was his version of events? Basically, I think it was the they dumped the head in the Florida, in, you know, for the alligators, you know, so we got rid of the head uh, that they bought from upstate New York, and um, one of the guys started bragging about it, and they found this head in the swamp alley. And that was it. So the rest death. is history. Headless Harry, we call him. <laughs> yeah. But there was people in there that would get arrested for buying bird seed from a feed store and get um, arrested for trafficking him. And by the time they realised it's just bird feed, you've had your car towed, broken into... Uh, they found out you violate your probation in New York and all hell's been let loose because you got a bag of bird seed in your car. <laughs> yeah. Another guy, he got uh, a life sentence for a non-violent crime. 
He was a small-time guy, career criminal. He had payroll checks at like $1,500 each, a grand each, about six or seven. Because they just had enough of him, you know, we've had enough, they trumped the charge up to racketeering, which is punishable by life, by photocopying all these checks to now make it look like there's 60 checks. Look at all these checks. But they were all shuffled together and they went from six checks to 60. Jury, that's a lot of checks. Life. He died while I was in prison. His girlfriend, who went along for the ride, didn't really want anything to do with crime. She got 25 years. Oh, my God. What? And that's Florida. Mm, Florida. That's Florida. Loads of stories you meet yeah, people. You c- going out for a pizza, getting shot at by Fort Lauderdale police and all that. Man. You did? No, I'm a mate, and I met in there, just went out for yeah. his girlfriend. Big a guy fight. wouldn't let his girlfriend have the Jeep. You know, I want to get out, shut up. And, you know, he carried on driving. Uh, kidnapping, punishable by life. He got a life sentence because he wouldn't let her out, and that's kidnapping. Yeah, Florida. Even if the cops shoot your car up, you get five years and you're innocent. You get ten years for shooting a, uh, killing the police dog. Yeah. Oh, uh, Florida does not play. No. It will really, really slam you. And a lot of these people are first-time offenders. There was no chance of second chance because they're getting 50 years. Well, there's 200 prisons in Florida, and they're still building more. National Guard are out, though. That's all quiet, isn't it? They're working in the prisons. Did you know that? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, because the gangs are kind of taking over a lot of the prisons because... Who are the gangs? Well, the most gangs in Florida are in control of the Latin Kings. Latin Kings. And they're the ones who uh, you want to be on the right side of. And, you know, they're honourable and, uh, you know, they're not going to mess with you unless you, you're a problem. And if you can help them, all the better. So did you have to come to a deal with the Latin Kings? I never had a problem with anybody. Yeah. See, it was different for him because I'm in different prisons and, uh, you know, just different. And yeah, they just thought because of me charge and what I was and all that, they just yeah. thought I was a bit of a lardy da guy, you know what I mean? Just yeah, if you've problem. got a, a real charge and it's nothing to do with a sex charge or anything like that, yeah, they leave you alone. you're halfway there. And, of course, if you stand up for yourself, then, again, I would definitely respect that as well. It's yeah, I get, I got promoted all the time. See, the guards and the warden, they know they can just tell by your mannerisms, like, it, it, come here, that's a fade. You're, you've had a fade. No, my hair's faded. <laughs> I haven't had a fade. I wouldn't pay for haircuts. you got to pay, ain't you? Inmate barber. Not yeah. pay. Honey How buns. That? Just not pay. Ramen. Huh? It sounds like you were feared in prison. Why? How did you get away with that? Well, you just don't back down, but I was never violent, never threatened anyone, but you just stand your ground. You just see mannerisms, isn't it? Really, don't mess with me. Yeah, they will fear, you know, if you was white and bald-headed and tattoos, you were naturally feared as, you know, because of the way you look. And so it's all down to body language. It's, they look for the weak people and it's not easy to f- uh, find out who's weak and who's not. And, of course, with me, you know, I was a, just as aggressive back as them because, you know, I didn't find any of them to be any more gangster than me and I'm not a gangster, so they definitely wasn't. And I just thought they was. and uh, Like you'd be standing on the wreck field, just hanging about in the shade, and all of a sudden, smack! The guy next to you get smacked by the gang. And then you're like, oh, my God. So then you'll be in his cell a couple of hours later, then they come in and smack him again. You're like, oh, my God. But you just walk away. Keep your head down. Yeah, either he's a kiddie fiddler, so they're smacking him. Now he's got to send $400 a month in to keep not getting smacked. So, Malcolm, you called somebody boss one time, just in a friendly way, but it backfired. Yeah. I said, uh, hello, boss, um, big African guy. Get some coffee. 
no, you can't call me that. I mean, sorry, son of a bitch in backwards. <laughs> but he come one of my best mates in the end anyway. Um, <laughs> he followed me into prison, so, and he was, uh, he was all right. They're all all right once they get to know you. Well, you know, all right and good. And Scary well, at first. But I do some know. sewing. I can sew your buttons on. Life has been in there for, but they've been released. The people who got life were released, weren't they, early. They could go home, they'd do another robbery, get some, have some more kids and come back in again and get another life sentence. There was a guy in my prison who was doing life sentence for stealing a black and white TV. And it was a, like a home invasion and she was trying to stop him from pushing it through the window and he pushed her and she pushed him and... He got away with a black and white TV and he got a life sentence. Yeah, touch and strike of a person over 60 you're, in, you're doing life. Yeah. Uh, verbal abuse of the elderly, is, uh, that's a third degree felony. You can uh, get up to five years for verbally abusing your in-laws. Do they do three strikes in Florida? Uh, no, they don't do three strikes, but it's pretty much... You're getting striked anyway, aren't you? Yeah, one strike's enough. Yeah. <laughs> First offence, you're gone. Yeah. So, Phil, we were at your prison that was by the medical facility. What was the next prison that you went to? Uh, the next prison was Columbia CI, which was also a psychiatric prison. The only reason they put me in a psychiatric prison was... They were trying to experiment with psychotropic drugs for my condition of what they said was spasmonic dysphonia, which they are using these drugs to see if they can uh, correct the, the link from your brain to your vocal cords and, you know, maybe just confuse the, the the channels that go on in your mind with psychopathic uh, drugs. And so I tried them once and I fainted straight away and, and I, would, I had them once and kept spitting them out, spitting them out, but I ended up having to be in this psychiatric prison for that reason. And what was your living conditions like in the dormitories with seventy men Chaos. that was all had all kinds of personal issues and uh, just noise and intimidation and uh, just sleep with one eye open all the time. And, Always uh, try and get a corner bunk bottom in yeah. the corner, and so if it kicks off, you can. Bunk beds everywhere Get and in the corner. just mm. open showers, open toilets, no privacy, uh, just dormitory life. And, I'd be swinging uh, them at you. That's really yeah. inhumane, isn't it? Open yeah. showers and toilets. Yeah. Well, everyone... have got uh, no privacy. Most, most men go back them. to their childhood, believe me or not. When they're in there, they want their mums and girlfriends and want yeah. the best so of everything. So after Columbia, I went to... Uh, um, what was the other one? Am I not? Um, I went to Dade CI, which is in Miami, and uh, that was off the chain. Yeah, that was one of the most uh, you know bizarre prisons because yeah. it was Miami, and so yeah. it was wide open because the guards were ecstasy parties at Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> they, you know, it was just even next door to me. Cell phones everywhere yeah. and uh, drugs everywhere. Yeah. And they would come in and they would demolish the whole dormitory, rip all the mattresses open. They'd kick all the U-bends uh, off the sinks, looking for everything and just completely wreck it and walk away. And then the inmates would got to fix it all up. The plumbers have got to come in. The electricians have got to come in. Uh, all the mattresses are all torn up and just crazy. Well, where mattresses were that? The old school, weren't they? What was it? Just them old. Like yoga mats, that skinny ones. Yeah, with the... Yeah, with the stripes. Straw. Just straw, isn't it? Straw mattresses. Straw. I used to uh, double them up, you know, put two mattresses together and... Sell them for a bag of coffee. There'd be like a mattress missing in the dormitory and they'd go around looking and there'd be one big fat one and 
One little I'll be thin feeling one, like a wheat sorry for everyone giving them extra blankets and then my bosses show up at five in the morning, kick me out of bed and I'll be in trouble because everyone's wrapped up in six blankets and I've been giving them out and they're all short in the prison and I'll be up in, in trouble for it. Did you get many disciplinary reports? None. None. I was the one for that. I had about four or five. What were they for? Fighting all of them. Four yeah. or five of them? Yeah, fighting. And what was the stories behind those fights? Just people picking on me and me not letting them <laughs> and them fight and physically fight and struggle and wrestle and end well, up the going to day, jail. He and came into general population, battered all his knuckles and fingers. Been yeah, straight away. Straight to... away, even in the county jails, I was doing it because I just. They picked on him all the time. Well, they just pick on people because they thought I was old and that, you know vulnerable, and they found out that I wasn't, and you know they. But you know, you go to the next place, they don't know who you are, so you go through the same cycle all over again. It's, hard, it's, it's when not you got until they realise that. Yeah. Don't mess with him because, you know, he's going to cause you I went war. to one, two, three, four places, like three places in immigration. You have to reestablish yourself every time. Yeah, well, when they keep moving you back to the county jail, that's horrible when you're in prison for no apparent reason, just for getting paid. County jail's the worst. Oh, horrible madness in them old type six-story ones down, down Fort Lauderdale. When you're looking at the... The old pubs you used to go in down there and all that, because I was working in the shipping business down there, building $10 million motor yachts, when I, for the rich and famous. Living at large, strawberries and cream down at Key West and all that, and sea trials. So you mentioned the open plan toilets. Was the protocol, if you're doing a number two, drop one, flush one, flush. drop one, flush one? My yeah, heart. courtesy flush, it was yeah, called. I wouldn't. What would you do? I'll be like, they'll be like, put water on it. I'm like, it's in water already. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't do it. But yeah, no privacy and no. just, yeah, open showers. Even if you're in a six-man cell, you've got toilets open, and it? It's open plan in the cell. But we, it, when you're in a two-man, it's different. You, you know your mate needs his privacy. You know what he does, and you know, and it's easy. Did you have toilet paper rations? Yeah, yeah, but that's all crazy and all. They're all crazy about that. They're all crazy about razor blades. But we had no no fan, no air conditioning and metal window with holes drilled in it in my prison. Did you have a swamp cooler? No. What? A swamp cooler. We had hot water on tap outside my room. So seven in the morning, I was first out for me coffee. Yeah, I had a swamp cooler. That was a bit of plastic over the vents to make a wind tunnel. Oh, no, we you, we used to cut sheets and make a sow out of them. And it created that. Amazing. It was so clever, how it brought the, the breeze in. But we just had, I had a metal winder in my cell with holes drilled in it. That was it. Yeah, solitary confinement. You couldn't look out the window at all. You just... Look out. And well, that guy's just done 27 years in solitary in America. Which one? I can't remember his name. I watched him a couple of days ago. He just got out. He'd done a lot of law cases about it, but they said, well, now you've been released. There's nothing you can do about it. Oh, the guy we had on, Nick Yaris? No, he's American. I just watched him a couple of days ago, 27 years in the box. He escaped from um, Texas and they hated him from a Supermax. Wow. Yeah, it's interesting watch. But I don't know how the TV crew are allowed to go into a prison and actually talk to him through the screen now. Well, they just some every every prison's different. It's got its own set of rules, and they some will, some won't, won't they? Same in this country, you can get access to certain places, and others are off limits. So when he got released, I was on holiday. I like my holidays. So I called him up, got my daughter to drop in an airline ticket round. And I've been going backwards and forwards to Cambodia ever since. He's addicted to it. Yeah. It's the best well, place in the world. We're jumping ahead a bit. Hold on a sec, we're not quite there yet, the release story. <laughs> You're on prison number three of seven. Yeah. What was prison number four? 
Madison, which was a nasty prison, nasty guards. I was working, making, uh, retreading boots, make, resoling the boots. They made new boots as well, but they would resole the boots. So, you know, that was a job I didn't like, and I soon got a pass to um, avoid dust. <laughs> Because of my throat, I had a pass. You've got to get the passes. And I couldn't I do passes. this, and I couldn't do that, and I couldn't do physical uh, exertion. And the only way I got out of that camp was sign up for another psychiatric camp just to get out. And once I got out, then although it was a psychiatric camp, which was Dade CI, was still better than where I'd just come from, you know, so it was better to deal with the psych did, patients did than the, the psychiatric uh, prison guards. Everglades Prison? Yeah, Glades, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, that's it, yeah. Oh, you went there? Yeah, seven total. And did you have a fight at the previous place? Uh, I had a fight nearly all of them, nearly, you know, sc just mostly scuffles, but sometimes you'd end up going to the box for 30 or 40 days and that was what happened and what was it like in the box boring very boring <laughs> you can't do anything uh no books or anything sometimes you know they would you know you could they go fishing and they would you'd be surprised you know you'd look out the wind out the door the little keyhole and you'd see two sandwiches following one another into <laughs> someone else's cell and a cigarette would go by that's a light and that would go up and it would go down and you'd see it go under a door and you'd see a prison guard just stepping over it where he didn't see it and so they would have an you know, amazing skill at making fishing lines. Can you tell the viewers how they make fishing lines? They'd make it from the, um, the elastic. Sheets. No, from the elastic, from the your boxer shorts. You know, they would spin it. I would make my own string for sewing, so I would spin the the thread from the um, the elastic band, and I would make string, and they would. Then use maybe a paper clip for a hook. It didn't have a weight on it. Uh, well, they would use um, some uh, toothbrush, um, toothpaste tubes as the actual weight. Weight, and they would just skew that under the door. It would go round the corner into the next wind. Then they would transfer that down, down further, and a magazine would come by. <laughs> Or sandwich. <laughs> I remember in Supermax, and there's just, you know, I looked out my cell, and there was like an envelope just floating up to the top tier. There was things just, it was like there was poltergeists. Yeah, it was just unbelievable from top floor to second like floor. Fish fo upstairs, sandwiches fish all following one another. <laughs> a big trail of sandwiches, and they go over the kick, uh, the, you know, where the door is, and straight under the door. Um, Get stamps going this way, tobacco would be going that way. Backwards and forwards. Yeah, well, you could smoke when we was in there. There's a lot of uh, talent in prison, isn't yeah. there? And it's unused yeah. properly. Wasted. Yeah, there's a lot of intelligent people in there. It's a shame because prison should only be for violent people. Violent people. People who hurt other people. You know, why I would agree. you put someone who's non violent in with someone who's extremely violent? That person's going to come out most probably violent. I come out very angry. I wanted to jump down everybody's throat for no real reason. I was just had a short fuse and I wasn't like that. Why did you do that? Were there any stories of extremely violent or dangerous prisoners that you heard, like boogeyman stories? Well, yeah, there was all kinds of stories with, you know, some of these lifers that had been in there all the time, you know, they had been beaten and, all, you know, their ribs were broken and their arms were broken, they were raped possibly and yeah. all kinds of... And they were traumatised, some of yeah. these men. You could just tell that they that just a shell of a man that, Maybe never going to get out. No. Yeah, they're going for a driving offence and end up getting life. Been in the box eight years. They release them. The first day they're out, they're fighting and going mad again, attacking inmates. They can't deal with it being eight years in the box. 
Yeah, some go in there and they get well, out of prison and go straight back in. They the, can't handle it. The Jamaicans do a lot of time in the box so they won't cut their dreadlocks off. So if you don't cut, you go in the box for your whole sentence. Wow. Because we all have to have skinheads. That's where yeah, my faded hair strict. came in. <laughs> you know, you're not allowed to have a needle. You're not allowed to have a a colouring pencil. You're not even allowed to have a pen that's not wobbly. You're not I allowed to... I had a needle. To, I was a sewer. Yeah, you have to make your own needle. Did you have little anti-shank toothbrushes? Yeah, you had to have the baby's toothbrushes. No, we had normal ones. Did you? Yeah. yeah could, could there was no shank problem in my place. I don't know about the glaze. I weren't there long, but in the place where I was, it was never any incidents Yeah, no, like that. there were knives where I was all the time. People, gangs have got them hidden away. Did so, you hear of any getting used? Uh, yeah, just a few times, but you actually witness it, but you hear about it, people getting stabbed and, uh, yeah, just drugged up on that spice and robbed and just terrible. So the Latin Kings do some hits. Here is a word from today's sponsor, Aura. If you Google someone, you can find out all kinds of personal information about them. This information is accessible because of data brokers who profit by selling your information to robocallers, telemarketers, spammers. You can use my link, https dot dot forward slash forward slash Aura dot com. Aura is A-U-R-A forward slash Sean Atwood, S-H-A-U-N-A-T-T Wood, to try two weeks for free and see how many data brokers are sharing your info. Also linked in my description box on this YouTube version or scan the QR code on the screen. Aura also monitors your emails and passwords to see if they were involved in a data breach and exposed on the dark web and gives you the recommendations on what to do. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need, all inside one app. Yeah, they did a few um, things while I was there, that, you know, people that would rob them of their contraband, contraband coming in and some, you know, some other gang thought that maybe they want to get that contraband and, you know, they, they don't play and they were, they were big, big gangs. So if you cross them, you lose. And luckily for me, I was okay with these guys and they respected me because I was just really like them. You know, I just stood up for myself like they do. And they respect that, don't they? Yeah, yeah that's why I checked yeah. in with the Jamaicans. Yeah, so, but they were the ones who run the prisons in Florida, the Latin Kings, I would say. Who's the next biggest gang? The Folk Nation. Fork Nation. Yeah, F A U K Folk. What na ethnicity are they? Anything, any any bun can be a, in the folk, and that was a that's a big gang, and anybody can join. And Latin Kings, you know, you were restricted to being a Latino, aren't you? So I couldn't be one. <laughs> <laughs> but then they had all the other gangs, the Bloods and the Crips. And the white supremacists. Yeah, when and you went that, gangs that you've never even heard of. Yeah, in yeah. the in the glades, the Everglades, you notice it more because everyone's doing life. Well, a lot of them, it's a long term prison, so I notice things going on there, like it, people getting slapped, newbies coming in, getting slapped up. But did you talk to the white supremacists? Uh, yeah, a few of them, but just. Didn't try and recruit, yeah? No, no, there wasn't really a lot of recruiting going on with people my age, you know, because... It's I the was... first time I got called Pops, and I was like, whoa. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah whoa. it's a young man's kind of thing, whoa. all that recruiting and being silly and, you know, childish. What about riots? Was there any riots? No riots, not that I witnessed. Uh, a few hurricanes. Yeah, there were some hurricanes. Sorry, what's a hurricane? Windy season in Florida, isn't oh, it? Oh, right. I thought you meant that was like a term for a riot <laughs> no, then. No. no, they used to lock us down. There's hurricane coming. No, that's a rumble. <laughs> <laughs> Get ready to rumble. 
And the people get agitated when they're locked down. But they're agitated all the time because they want their mum and their girlfriends. Everyone's on about, where's my baby mama? Where's this? Where's that? So when I was in charge of laundry, I'd have the worst linen, the worst clothes, the worst boots, everything, just to make a point. You don't need it. You'd have there. father and son in there, and the, the father would be like, that's my son over there, but he doesn't know who I am. What? He just thinks I'm his mother's friend, but I'm his, really, I'm his dad. Him over there, that guy. Yeah. Father and son, but the son don't know. He just thinks, oh, that's mum's friend. Hey, how you, how you doing? But really he's saying, hey, dad. Didn't even know. Brothers, uh, twin brothers, and uh, f just relations all in prison. So you saw twins in there? Huh? You saw twin brothers, did you say? Twins in there, yeah. What were they in yeah. for? I oh, know, it was crazy stuff. There was uh, one in there, they, his name was Rusty Nell. <laughs> That's his real name. Rusty Another guy's Nell. name was Outlaw, Mr. Outlaw. Yeah, crazy. What kind of tattoo, like tattoos, tattoos did you see? What tattoos? I didn't have any, no, but they had them all on their all head, in their ears, on the bottom of their feet. Everywhere, over every part of their body, they'd have bits of toothbrush in there on their, put inside their foreskins. Ah. Oh. Yeah, or bits of chest pieces. Yeah. Make a little slit in their foreskin and put it in and then cover it back up and then hopefully it'd heal up and it would be a little sex add-on, whatever they use it that, for. I've never heard anything like that. Yeah, no. Did they have tattooed dicks? Yeah, tattooed dicks. And uh, one guy, he said it was a butterfly, but it looked like a stag beetle. <laughs> 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 but yeah, no, inside their ears, on their neck, inside their lips, on their eyelids. Just everywhere. Always the teardroppy one, wasn't it? Teardrops, you know, that means that they've killed somebody and they haven't, or they think they have, and just crazy, crazy tattoos. What were your last two prisons, Phil? The last two was uh, Dade, which was Miami, and that was wide open with all kinds of things going on. You I've know, done you, two weeks in there. You could make money in there and uh, you buy and sell. And uh, and then it was the last prison was uh, Glades, oh, which no, is Glades. the stop-off prison before you go to immigration, which is basically walking distance. So that's the last stop. It's Glade, CI, and that wasn't too bad, although it was a lifer's prison. It was, you know, you knew that there was an end coming soon. And they were like butterfly wings. You had the, like the butterfly body, then all the wings went off. So main desk and all the controls, and they had four wings. And a massive wreck field, wasn't it? Yeah. With the guns going off, gun range. Yeah, you could see the tire, uh, you know, like the the outline of a prisoner, and he was the target. <laughs> you could tell he was, you know, he was in blue, so he had the right prison uniform on. And as you got near ten years, Phil, did you start to feel institutionalised? I suppose, yeah, you know, because what well, our choice is a natural thing to get used to your natural environment, and so it becomes. Every day, you just quite quick, really, for me. Yeah, just you just think it's well. Next month, you know, I've got my appeal in. I've got this motion in, and then you get the law work, and it just sets you back another three months. But you never think further than a, another year of this. You always think, well, another three months, and this will happen, and that will happen, and it never did. And then, and then you have the misery of waiting three months to get a passport to get back to the UK. Three months in immigration, although it, the conditions were like Butlin's holiday camp, it's still three months of... You've got to pay, though, haven't you? You've got to pay the diplomats to do it. You know, you've got to wait, and I had to wait. Phil, it, it, it sounds to me like once you got sentenced, you were living day by day, but then as you got near your release, did you start to think about the future? 
Yeah, I just didn't know what my future held. I didn't know what I had to come out to. And luckily, I still had my house, which was, a, you know, a blessing. But I lost a lot of my worldly belongings and um, family. My, my mother died while I was in prison. She thought I was coming home. She didn't even know I got that kind of time. She thought I just got a, a year or two. So she was struggling with cancer and... Every Christmas that would come by, is he coming, is he coming? And, yeah, that was sad because, mm. uh, you know, mum died in, while I was in prison. Uh, my wife ended up dying. Did they send the chaplain to tell you that is how it works? Yeah. Did they? Yeah. And, and as soon as you see the chaplain, do you know it's bad news? Yeah, well, I knew my mum was sick. And then when they call you, then you just know that, yeah, that's it, jeez. And there's nothing you can do. That's got to be so frustrating yeah. and, and heartbreaking because you yeah, can't be stuck in there. A card around. that she sent me just previously at Christmas had a, um, a chime to the card and they wouldn't give it to me because it had a little tiny battery in it that made it chime. Mm. And they had to send that Christmas card back all the way to England when they could have just took the battery out and give me the card. And I've still got that card and it still works, it still chimes, you know, and it's something that, well, you know, my mum had to go through all that misery for a while, I'm not a career criminal. I'm not out selling hardened drugs. I've never sold any drugs in my life. I've smoked, and that's about it. I've been a hard Green. worker. Green. Did, did and you, that, that's it. It's just a crazy thing to do to somebody. Did your son and family members visit you in prison? Uh, no, but my son was only three at the time. And, you might um, did, didn't you? Yes, did. Yeah, my friend do. He come and visited me twice while I was in prison. That was nice. And he would send me money and my other friend would. And uh, my family pretty much disowned me and uh, took everything I had that was had any value and left me with, you know, just nothing. Some car parts. You know, my inheritance was vanished and oh. uh, they just, you know, they didn't think I was going to make it back out. Oh, he's gone. He'll never make 15 years in a Florida prison. No, that's it. It's a free-for-all. Get his stuff. And and they did. And uh, it was a lot of stuff, a lot of valuable stuff. That all my clothing, as we speak, are 25 years old. How old is that? Except my oh, jeans, wow. my shoes, all this is 25, 30 years old. That's what I had to come out to. You know, I still had clothing that... We bought that in Marshalls, didn't we? Yeah, 20 25 years, years, ago. years ago, everything. <laughs> Mal know. Malcolm, did you stay in touch with Phil while he was sentenced? No. No, he went off to Cambodia. Oh, you're not allowed? Prisoners oh, aren't allowed went, to stay in touch. I only went on holiday yeah. for a little bit. A prisoner's banned from contacting ex-prisoners anyway. Well, they, there was a way around it, wasn't there? But I was contacted by um, an organisation called Prisoners Abroad. Yeah, pretty and fake, they helped they? me with all kinds of... Oh, they helped of, me. Did they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was a good organisation. I yeah. got newsletters and they would be willing to help me if I needed somewhere when I got out. And uh, yeah, very nice. And uh, I had visits from them. I used to watch him online because you could go on Tappy Tappy, couldn't you? Florida Inmate Search. So I did that a lot. Oh, what, look at his DLC Yeah, page. then we learnt a lot. We could look at other stuff and read other stuff. So we kept an eye on him, knew what was going on, and even stuff showed up. And I'm like, whoa, what's happening? I've had people call me, what's going on with Philip in America? And like, But he never knew nothing about it, but it used to show up on the internet. Imagine just the fact that you have to put a confidential informant in a jury for what, you know? Are you really that desperate Corrupt. to get a conviction from, I'm not a career criminal, I never broke into no one's home. Why me? Why didn't you do that to the man who was a real criminal and a but real But the judge knew. Up? She said, where's the evidence? They couldn't come up with it and she carried on. What was your day of release like, Phil? Uh, very strange, very surreal, you know, like... Early in the morning, isn't it? Yeah, just everything was just, is it really happening? And, uh, it Did was they put a, you in a red jumpsuit? No, I had a grey jumpsuit with an orange T-shirt like that. Walk you to the gate? 
yeah, same procedure, yeah. you know, going on the tarmac of the plane and, you know, you don't see planes normally when you're underneath them. You think, my, look at the size of this thing and you go up the, the steps and that, that's it. When you go to the hospital there, they will put a smock on you and they'll shackle you and everything, but they'll put a blanket over you and the guard, he'll be dressed up as a doctor. You know, <laughs> they'll put one of these... Uh, make up things on him but he's got his uniform underneath and then we'll push you around the hospital to each department and uh, then change to the bed and I remember this nurse once saying to me now I'm all getting ready to have an operation I didn't know and so they put the pre um, pre-med in it pre-med in your arms so you're getting drowsy feeling good and uh <laughs> I'm cuffed to the bed and shackled to this bed and this nurse put her finger into my face and said, you better keep your hands to your goddamn self. And I'm thinking, I'm looking at this one thinking, what? God, you'd have no problem. No, there's no problem for me ever touching you. What are you wishful thinking or something? Why would you even <laughs> say that? Another guy, because I'm, just because I'm a prisoner, he said I was a malingerer. I'm making all this up. I'm not, I've got a voice, it's normal. I'm just all making it up. If I come off the street and say, no, no, like, I, 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 he wouldn't say that, would he? Oh, sit down. Oh, no, you got, oh, yes, this is serious. Because you're a prisoner, he's not, he's just making it up. He's a malingerer. <laughs> <laughs> what what did it feel like stepping on the plane? Oh, just that was it. Just, I knew. I knew then. Were you the first on? Yes, first on, and then that was it. No one was any the wiser that I was a, an ex con or anything because I was wasn't in. I was in civilian clothing. Were you greeted by the cabin crew? Uh, Yes, they was all nice and friendly and they had my passport and so I suppose they was alerted to keep an eye on me. Did they, did they the talk back. to you like you were a human being? Yeah, with them days yeah. you had the marshals on board, didn't you? And it was a pleasant flight. And I didn't even recognise my friend who picked me up at the airport. Who picked you up? Rick and Nigel. I said to my friend Nigel, where's Rick? And Rick was walking straight towards me and... I didn't recognise my best friend. After I went to school with and everything. And how much had the world changed? A lot. There was a big court, uh, conifer tree in my garden that was 30 feet, 35 feet tall. And it wasn't <laughs> even there when I left. It wow. wasn't even a twig. Yeah, big conifer tree, massive, just like a, couldn't get much bigger. And that wasn't even there. So reality started to kick in. What then. about technology? Everything. I didn't know anything well, we about didn't cell it. phones, internet. Yeah. We bought our first uh, cell phone in a gas station in Cambridge, Mass. Anything to do with a gadget, TV, remote. I didn't know anything about nothing. I still don't. That's because really. you guys went in the same time as me. I was 2002. Yeah, so 2003. I missed, I missed texting and all that stuff. We just bought our first mobile phone in 96, 97, didn't we? From the gas station. Big old Motorola house brick. brick. I had one of them. Yeah, yeah I, I had one of them one. years before that in England, but when I moved to America, I, like, I don't know why they were behind us. Then it was the Nokias, wasn't it? Yeah, well, we had the Motorola um, in the end, the walkie-talkie phones. They were excellent. Yeah. I love them. But even now, I still shake my head with prices. A fish and chips, six, seven pound. No, haircut, what? ten pound. No, I can't. What date did you get released? It was uh, January, about March of 2017. Wow. And would you say you were like decompressing for the first few weeks, months? Yeah, for the first year, you know, you still can't. Because I was used to actually living in America at that time as well, so I'm not only getting used to being out of prison, I'm now getting used to being living back in England where I would normally only come to England for maybe a few weeks on business and then go back. So, I'm, you know, just the, the change of actually living back in England. Reverse culture shock. 
with a sculpture shock, you know, pulling out um, on the other side of the road on in cars. Oh, I did that. Time. I pulled out, went that way into yeah. oncoming yeah, traffic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I still when do I first it. Got back. I still do it. You still do it. It's, it's dangerous. It was, yeah, you can kill somebody. I, I, I was it. lucky that the, the light was on red and the traffic was stopped. Yeah. But if they'd have been coming, I would have drove straight into yeah, a vehicle. No, I'd done it not that long ago on the other side of the road. I have to really think, and I'm left hand handed as well, so I'm all confused. Dot com. I'm used <laughs> to driving a left hand drive car in the UK, so now I'm in a right hand drive in the UK, and I'm used to driving on the right in a left-hand drive car, and then I haven't been on the road for all them years as well, so I'm just all very confused. You don't really want to get too close to me <laughs> just yet. And you said you had a girlfriend when you went in, but you lost her, did you? Well, she was my wife, Your and, wife. Which, you know, we were separated, but, you know, hoping to get back together. And we, was was on we was on holiday when she passed away. Yeah, and she was waiting for me to get out, and finally did get out, and... Uh, and she died for no apparent reason. First time I see him have a tear in his eye. Yeah, he knocked on my front door on the beach down in Cambodia. She didn't really die of any I didn't know. cause, you know. It was more Worked like for the a Boston broken Globe. heart she did. type thing. It's sad. And like I say, my son's going to uh, Cambridge University next month. And I've never, I've only met him once. So he's done well for, you know, growing up without his dad. But I couldn't be his father. That was deprived for what? You know, I'd have been a good father to my son. I was a good father to my daughter. And so she was about 12 or something when I went into prison. So, you know, I was had bonded with her. She was my daughter. and But I couldn't do the same with my son because he was only three. So I lost all that. I lost my mother. I lost my voice. You know, you would have thought I was Jack the Ripper, wouldn't you? <laughs> and I'm not. The way the way in which people date, it's, it's all it revolves around technology now. So, you know, as a single person getting out of prison, did, did you uh, date women, or was that too psychologically, you know, tricky with the? It's all it's all like plenty of fish and stuff, isn't it? Yeah, well, Match to me, com. I, uh, That's No, I ago. just called him up and got done the easiest thing for him. Hello, Phil. Kate, you'll be around in a minute with an airline ticket for you. I'll be waiting for you at the airport in Cambodia. Oh. So I flew him to Cambodia. So oh. the, the technology came, you know, he did come, but it's very slow and uh, bit by bit. And I am where I am now, which isn't that, you know, I'm not that, uh, you know, good on a computer or anything, but. I've come a long way. I, I, yeah, he sells on eBay now, don't you? Yeah, I've learned to spell well, before I could. <laughs> well, we couldn't spell because of being in America. They spell different, don't they? Yes, so you get confused. But, you know, doing all this law work, you know, you soon learn to spell and you soon learn, you know, your English improves and uh, your computer skills learn a bit because, you know, I'd be uh, doing all the research on my case and, you know, I've got, so much law work that I've generated and I just want to go that extra few miles just to see if I can you know where are you going to aren't you you, you know going. I need to get something for what happened you know you 13 years for baby laxative. if why didn't you just give me a slap on the wrist like um, uh, you do with your murderers there was an English guy in there he killed his roommate and he reloaded the gun twice because the bullets were no good. He shot him about 14 times, finally killed him, and he got seven years. Yeah, I met Ridiculous. some English guys doing life, fighting, murder. Yeah, I the got guy more died. time. Met smugglers as well, diverted planes, uh, plastic Paris leg full up with white, come into Miami, uh, what's in there, in you go. Yeah, I met a few English people. Mm. Guy ripped a woman's leg off at a gas station. Her car jacked her, her car and she went to get in the car while he was pulling away and he put it in reverse and he, her leg got caught between the door and the gas pump. Oh. Ripped her leg off and he got five years and I've done a lot more than that. And he didn't rip any legs off. Yeah, so he arrived in Cambodia at the airport. I picked him up. I said, come on, we're going downtown. I've got your hotel room and you... 
you're going to be hanging out with me uh, girlfriend's sister (laughs) (laughs) she had a good time yeah Yeah. (laughs) but yeah no it was a shock to my system because everything was expensive you know how much for that he didn't have to pay for anything well you know no I mean in England the prices of you know wow no car insurance 600 no you're crazy yeah and I'm still like it now I'm like how much for that? Five pounds? I booked a table last night in a restaurant, said so don't look at the prices of the menu. It's all on the house. <laughs> that was last night and this morning, free breakfast in a hotel. But yeah, no, it's a, it is a tragedy all around because it's a long time, you know, for, to do for what? You know? well, looking back on it all, do you have any regrets or is there anything you would do differently? We yes. thought we was grown up men, but we wasn't. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't go to Florida. No. Do you credit the experience then with yeah. forcing you to mature? Yeah. Well, I'm certainly a wiser man. You can't yeah. scam me on the internet or no. anything like yeah, that. Can, I won't no. be sending you any <laughs> checks or any anything like that. Well, we was talking about it on the way here. We you know people have got loads of money, loads of this, loads of that, but they've never been anywhere. So if you haven't made any mistakes, you haven't lived, I used to own my own trucking company and all that, you know. I've worked for Marks and Sparks, I wait till it goes. I've worked for the Coop when I got out. And then I uh, got some a lot of inheritance, so which I spent immediately. And my family stole my inheritance. Why not? Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, crazy. Did you confront them about that when you got back? No, I, did. I didn't. I didn't really. There was a, a lot of money that went missing, and I was just waiting for them maybe to explain, and they never did, and I I never did, and I did recently, and. Uh, I didn't get a positive response apart from stay away from my family. Yeah, I went down there. He said, can you go and see him? I did, so I went down there. They went, well, we got to go in the garden. And that was it. No, 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 yeah, no. no Where's that? No, 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 no. What's your biggest life lessons from all this? Don't do it again. Don't trust anybody. Yeah. And only lie to the police and the judge. <laughs> <laughs> and tell the truth to everyone else. Course. and go on holiday if you live can live the straight and narrow lifestyle yeah. I suppose you know because life is short and uh, you know 13 years can just put a big spanner in your works you know and uh, luckily you know I survived and I'm re- relatively healthy I used to walk 17 miles every day in prison if you had three wrecks I'd walk five miles, five miles, seven miles every day. So that kept me sane and fit. Um, A lot of English people I was with. But you can go the other way, can't you? They walked all in prison all the time. They just walked for miles and run and run and run. As soon as we was let out, just run. Did you ever find out what happened to the guy who set you up? The guy who they said, get five more people and uh, we'll reduce I think he just your... got probation and he went on to set other people up. He had a deal of maybe setting up four or five We got people. the word out, though, who he was. Yeah, and he was just a small-time loser and he didn't want to do he any time. He was young time. and all, wasn't he? And I'd done his time and, and he continued being a career criminal. And who, where he is now, who knows, but... It's the insanity of the war on drugs. Puerto Rican, wasn't he? Yeah, Puerto Rican. Young kid at work. He was a store manager at my shipyard where I was working. And I see him without a shirt on one day at work. I'm like, that's weird. That's weird. Why ain't he got a shirt on? Because he didn't. He was wiretapped when I met him a few times. Because I was bugged for 90 days. On the phone. Yeah, they had a TV in the motel next door with holes going through the door. And when Malcolm went into the hotel room, he, he fell back on the bed. You know, I, my you, nickname was Horizontal because I was always chilled out and laying around. Yeah, so, yeah, so he on knocked the, the cameras the out of whack, didn't you? Yeah. He you couldn't the, hear nothing because I was laying on the mic. So then the other cameras kicked in from next door, but they had a TV show going in the background. Uh, supermarket sweeps and you couldn't see because of the interference from the tv and yeah and when we had when i had meets with them and all that and 
they couldn't hear nothing. No, everywhere I met them in a restaurant or what, they couldn't Did hear any, anything yeah, through the, the mic. police station was bugged and everything. Everywhere they put us. They, they really don't play by the rules at all, and they don't care. They really don't care. Yeah, because the public defender, the first minute in court, he come over and he's sitting behind me and he's, yeah, there's a bit of paper, you've been under surveillance for 90 days and wiretap. I'm like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, no, they... Uh, they had him good. They had him on video, audio, everything. I wasn't even in Florida. They didn't know. They thought we come from England. They didn't know where he was. So what do you guys want from life now? Just freedom. <laughs> Continued <laughs> freedom. Yeah, no, life's good now, really. Yeah, life is good. I, uh, I, I don't want anything, really. I have everything I want. I'd like to get my voice back. Do you appreciate things more because yeah. you lost everything? Everything, yeah. everything I appreciate. I don't waste food. I don't, I'm not mean to anybody. No. I just give more than to other people than I give to myself, you know. Well, when I got... Well, Especially I'm, in Cambodia. When I was in prison, I got ill. Not ill, I just felt rough one day. I was in the gym working out and I had to kick the door in one night. It, I was hurting, my shoulders were hurting and all that. And they gave me, bought me some pills, the guards, because I didn't have no money. But when I got released, I went to bed normal one night, woke up with this overnight. What lay dormant because I had that come up when I was sitting next to you, didn't I? In the old and like, is that a ganglion? No, rheumatoid. I'm like, what the hell's that? That's a and they called it carpal tunnel in prison. But when I got released, they'd done a blood test on me and I had rheumatoid. Oh, so uh, and then they just um, pensioned me off because of my illness, UC50. So you've been running all these businesses and you, how does it feel to be pensioned off? Strange. It's hard to get used to, you don't, you know. But it's all right now, I'm getting used to it. But I can't do much, can't do anything. I've got an electric scooter. That got a blowout last night, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> See, and I'm okay. I'm kind of very fit. It's just my voice, really. So there's me going through town on my electric scooter and Phil walking alongside me. <laughs> yeah, I outpace you, you electric scooter. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you say to the young people watching this who might be tempted to do the kind of deals do that not you guys get are involved in? involved in any hard drugs whatsoever don't put all your eggs in one dead basket. end street it's a guaranteed dead end yeah. street anything to do with white brown brown, brown. brown. <laughs> green green anything it's just not worth well it. greens Life decriminalize is... and you can get it on prescription if you've got yeah. ailments since 2019 yeah. and we're not yeah. talking about that anyway we're talking about the harmful drugs yeah. that hurt people and cause all kinds of problems. And why would you want to do that? It's a terrible thing to even get involved in. And there's an easier way to make money than do that kind of thing, you know. If people want to contact you guys, do you have any socials or anything? Yeah, well, I'm on uh, Phil Lee. Uh, uh, I'm Gmail. just on Instagram. Com. On the ground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not Facebook. We'll put your email in then and we'll put your Instagram in in case anyone wants to contact you. I don't you. even know what it's called. But I don't log into nothing. I'm all tappy tappy, stay out through the back door. Pass me phone, please. Right, so is there anything you'd like to say in conclusion? Thank you. Great to be yeah, here. It took you. me years to come here and get Phil here. I know. No, thank you, guys. And what Thanks was we guys. talking about on the way up here? Something, what did we say? Compensation, want compensation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was saying else. So. But, you know, I think I deserve it. You do. Medical Jacksonville Memorial Hospital, cough up, you're a multi million dollar. Yeah. Thing they, if they knew that maybe he was going to do a story on the way, what they do, and they mm. do do it, they might want to settle out a call. Yeah, you prisoners could, abroad would be a good one to contact. They have yeah. resources for prisoners. Yeah, you're making notes yeah. of this because we're going to yeah. forget. Yeah, that's me on Instagram. Are we still live? Yeah. So it is at H A W E S Malcolm. Spelt wrong though. <laughs> M A L C O-L-M. Yeah. M, is it? Or an N? M. M. 
Um, Milk is spelt right. Oh, is it? Oh, it must be my email that it's spelt wrong. Because uh, my daughter does all my admin. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the link will be down there for it Instagram is. and Phil's email as well. I kill you! I yeah! A knife and a cush and all that, like. Yeah! And he's looking at me, and we went white, and there he's gone, like. <laughs> <laughs> What is it about a tough guy that fascinates us? Imagine I'm hearing that, I'm thinking I'm not going down today. If I go down today, yeah, I'm dead. We're bringing you the very best of our interviews with Britain's hardest men. They made the mistake of bringing billy cubs, iron bars and knives to a gunfight. No Rules Fighter Bash, Stephen the Devil French and my best friend, Wild Man. Over two hours of terrifying tales of punch-ups, stabbings. That's what happens in that world. You, you leave people long enough, they get enough rope to hang themselves. Attempted murders and exceptional all-round hardness. This film is available to rent or own on Amazon or Vimeo. Plus, the first 30 customers to order this film Get a 30% discount on any Vimeo order. Click the link below to see if you're one of the lucky ones. This film will drop your jaw like a punch from the hard men we talk to. So why not order your copy today? Chet Sandu's book is finally available worldwide on Amazon. He's one of our most viral podcast guests ever. The book is called Self Made, Jews Paid, an Asian kid who became an international drug smuggling gangster. Do you want to read some of the back, Jen? Yeah, go the blurb. In 1999, Chet Sandu was arrested at gunpoint in Alicante Airport for smuggling the largest quantity of illicit pharmaceutical drugs in Spanish history. Interesting. Overnight, he went from living in the shadows of the Costa del Crimes underworld to be labelled a notorious supervillain in the international press. Incarcerated alongside murderers, rapists and terrorists in a super maximum security wing. He had to navigate a world of murderous knife fights, prison breaks, drug taking and high stake power plays. Good bedtime read. In Self Made Jews Paid Learn how a British born Asian kid with disabilities Raised in a corner shop, emerged as a protector of his family from racist thieves and hooligans. Be prepared to be entertained, informed and offended by Chet's no-holes-barred account of raves, drugs, bodybuilding, entering the fashion industry. Did you know that he dated Kylie Minogue and Naomi yes. Campbell? <laughs> latest interview. Working the doors and life in one of the world's deadliest places to be incarcerated. If you enjoyed Chet's podcast series with us, there's a lot more detail in the book. Check it out. Worldwide on Amazon, ebook, paperback, and audiobook.